Folks, it's Tuesday. It's time to submit to the High Council here on World Class Bullshitters. I'm your host, Jeff Hicks. With me, as always, is my co-host, Caffeinated Wolf. What's going on, Jeff? Welcome back from uh, Horror Hound. Oh, <laughs> thank you. I uh, I still feel like my body is at Horror Hound. So, folks, I uh, look like death because I feel like death. I we had a lot of like fun that. at Horror Hound. I'm tired as hell. Oh, my God. It was a blast. Um it was all about perfecting the woke busters pitch. So yeah, that book's okay. got the right kind of hype, but folks, we are not alone tonight. We are joined by our co-host. Say hello to the script doctor. Good evening. I am so happy to be here. Cause I have, I've been doing some plumbing for the last two hours. <laughs> so I'm, I'm happy to, now, is, to that a, uh, is that a double entendre that. or is that, I wish it were, but no, no, <laughs> I, I, no just, uh, Kitchen, right. bath, or laundry script. That'll tell Kitchen. us how bad of a time it was. Okay, not bad. Kitchen. Not bad, then. Yeah. Could be worse. Could be worse. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, finally, folks, our other guest for the evening. Our Say hello guest. to WDW Pro. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I feel like I should have a vampire voice or some kind of monstrous ghoul, considering how dark and scary the dislikes are for the acolyte. So, good evening, everyone. Well, hey, we can count the dislikes. Five hundred thousand. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> Will it break the uh, what was it? Was it one point five million that uh, Ghostbuster twenty sixteen got within that first uh, week? I think this one is. Uh, they're they're going to try to take down Rebecca Black's Friday first. No doubt about it. <laughs> mm. Oh, that's legendary. That's legendary. Uh, I we'll talk about the trailer in just a moment. We've all seen it. Yeah, so that's what we, we've we've said it, that before. It, it's like, a thing. Uh, it happened. Yeah, I had a kidney stone too. Uh, it's not it's not something to brag about, but you know. Yeah, I mean, it, watching <laughs> it didn't feel like trying to piss out a kidney stone, but it was uh, it was just a testament to Disney does not know how to make Star Wars exciting. I was watching it. I'm like, oh look, Carrie and Moss, and I forgot that it was supposed to be a Star Wars trailer. It was just like, oh. The, oh, those are lightsabers. Yeah, okay, yeah. Uh, oh, they're clearly, that's the Force. Got it, okay. Look at that. Trinity is wearing more comfortable clothes in this iteration of the Matrix. <laughs> <laughs> right? It's just, it was boring. It was a thing that happened. Like, it was a, it was an inoffensive trailer, but it was a boring trailer. It wasn't is something anyone more... else. Is anyone else not surprised that the former personal assistant to Harvey Weinstein began her trailer in Star Wars with Close Your Eyes? I imagine that was heard many times. <laughs> Yikes. It's I mean, a familiar phrase. It's probably a phrase, a phrase she's familiar with. Yeah, there's, there's maybe that. Uh, or uh, or I, I, mean, I looked at it more objectively. It's like that's the marketing department at Disney. They don't really listen to what she has to say. And oh, well, look at this. Leslie Headland. She's so inventive. She literally paraphrases a, an important lesson spoken by Obi-Wan in Star Wars and doesn't get the point of what it was or why you do it and just rehashes it here. Pretty much like a typical Star Wars fan film you'd find on YouTube. Great. So now, instead of seeing a free fan film on YouTube that has bad dialogue and poor acting, but at least passion behind it, we get to pay Disney Plus a monthly <laughs> subscription to see a bad fan film that is poor dialogue and almost zero passion behind it. Oh, boy. Doesn't yeah. that sound like fun? Doesn't mm -hmm. that just instill and incite confidence and enthusiasm in you? No? Crickin At least it's based on it. Frozen. Best. Frozen and Kill Bill, right? That's like, right. Like, how do you even... The Force never bothered me anyway. It, it, the canon never bothered me anyway is what it is. Like That's, <laughs> that's what it is. Because like, this is supposed to take, what, a uh, place 100 years before? Or how um, many... Maybe, maybe much earlier than that. Uh, maybe hundreds of years, but the High Republic. The only good news about putting in the High Republic is we don't have to see Thrawn again. Because mm. that guy that guy could not out-strategize a, a paper bag. So glad he's going to stay back with Ahsoka and uh, maybe the Mandalorian movie is what I'm hearing now. Mm. Yeah, well, I mean, they, they haven't movie. finished off his story, so they got to do something with him, right? Yeah, yeah. He's, he'll, he'll figure out how to get his ship to... Uh, Move it three miles per hour off of uh, a proctology stone again. Mm. He's, he was really good at that in Ahsoka. Where's the excitement? Like, for all the people can complain about the old Lucas stuff from the prequel era, at least it was exciting. It, this is the cure for insomnia with Disney Star Wars. It's like, what pious, boring characters can we create with lightsabers this week? 
And the Acolyte looks like it's going to be a lot more of that. I mean, have you seen one thing? They have merchandise for this shit, which we're going to make a video on. But two, it's already on clearance. And three, the names of these characters are ridiculous. Like, this is setting up to be the biggest fear and embarrassment. Wait a minute, Jeff. Anyway. Wait a minute. You can't just go by that. What do you mean it's already on clearance? Oh, I got pictures right here. Uh, they oh, already snap. Just, no. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I was on I was Jeff. on Amazon. I was like, what the hell? It's already down. I mean, it's not a huge markdown, but it's already on sale. Like, it's not out. It's 20% off before it's out. Oh, my gosh. That's how much people Ooh. care about these kids. Like, it's got well, three months before it's out. It's on clearance three months prior. His name is wow. Yord Fandar. What a great name. Fandar? Yord Fandar? Yord Fandar. So, folks, WCBS will have a video for mm. you. Uh, hopefully like tomorrow. Pig no, he's yeah. your fan. That's they're just, right. it, it, they're just pig throwing Latin letters. Making... They're just throwing letters into a blender, hitting, setting it to frappe, and like no, they're using that old um, Geo Cities Jedi name generator thing that was existed in the late nineties. <laughs> and check out our oh, our newest Jedi. So sad. Oh, we Fuge, see this happening. White guy. We're, we see this happening across the board with Marvel and uh, Star Wars properties. Anything owned by Disney at this point, because. Nobody gives a hoot about these characters. These characters haven't been endeared to audiences. And there's, on top of that, just no enthusiasm generated around the property you're not, you're itself. You're not excited anyway. about Fandar? Um, no, but that name is hysterical. <laughs> that, that has to become a meme at some point. Like, I, you know, uh, it was, I'm pretty sure it's the Great Pumpkin, Charlie Brown, where Linus goes, I have a rock, right? Charlie Brown has a rock. It's Charlie Brown that says it. That's right. That's right. Mm -hmm. And now I, it, when I hear that, I see Geode. So mm -hmm. now I feel like there needs to be a meme involving Fandar at this point. But it's so sad to see because Star Wars for me is in the characters. That that That's one of the major things that separates it from other sci-fi properties. It's I, I am endeared to these characters that I love for very specific reasons. And Disney Lucasfilm has put in absolutely negligible effort in endearing any of the characters that they've come up with to audiences. No wonder nobody cares about buying a toy of this character. Nobody likes that character. They don't know anything about them. You tell them they can do all of these things, but you, they don't know anything about them as a person other than maybe they're insufferable. Or maybe you marketed them as like, oh, well, this is a female character, or this is an Asian character, or this is a black character, or this is a, a character that's a literal rock. Like, who cares? Why should I care about this character at all? I liked Mace Windu. I didn't have a problem with him. No, he was saying because he was a badass with character. <laughs> was he really a badass character? Or was he played by Samuel L. Jackson, which made him actually way different and cool? Yeah, because like if you listen to the dialogue, <laughs> even Samuel L. Jackson's like, "I'm standing in front of a green screen and I sound like a weatherman more than a Jedi." Like, I get it. <laughs> yeah, but. He, in, uh, in the EU novels and comics, Mace Windu is a pretty bad Fair. Character. Look, I'm not the EU guy. I don't dislike it at all, but I'm, you know, I like the original movies, and that's about that's it fair. for me. I'm a production of those movies, is what I find fascinating, Star Wars fan. But I like I would much rather read the craft services list of the Empire Strikes Back than I would watch the Acolyte. And for those who don't know what that means, <laughs> well, it means I would rather read what they ate for lunch. <laughs> yeah. Like that's that's how I feel about this. Um, <laughs> half a million dislikes. I mean, you know, do, are they going to try to blame bigoted bots? Because we had uh, we talked about Disney using bots. You know, these buzzwords don't work on people anymore. What no, What's going to be the excuse when the acolyte shits the bed? Is it you misogyny again? You Girl. know what? You we're going to do. You guys have all seen Cabin in the Woods, right? We're going to start doing bets like they do in Cabin in the Woods, you know, how they did like uh, zombie fish. <laughs> yeah, we're going to start doing that. What are they going to blame us for this week and how are they going to do it? So who's stuck you... making out with a giant wolf mount head mounted uh, head on a wall? Like, I'm not doing that. No, I'm I not think even... by bringing it up, you've already make it a it. horse right. and it can be Dion. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think we need to lay bets on whether or not this thing gets to a million dislikes. That's the bet that needs to happen. It's at 555 in just a week. Surely over the next six weeks, and especially if the Acolyte continues to make news with stupid, stupid quotes out there like it's based on Frozen, 
it can do it. It can do it. It can make it to a million dislikes. I don't know what I, you guys think, though. I actually don't know if it's going to make it to a million dislikes. Not anytime soon, actually. And here's why. Not because people wouldn't dislike it, but because people don't give a shit to watch it. Like, it, it, it's too much effort. I got to type in. Star Wars Acolyte. Acolyte. Most people not can't Gatorade read, light. let alone spell Acolyte. So, all right, not going to do that. Um, and, and then they're not certainly not going to watch the thing. And most people forget to hit the thumbs up or thumbs down anyway. So, like, true. <laughs> Fix that here, folks. Hit that thumbs up button. Let us know you enjoy this stream. You heard it right That's here. Right. <laughs> Click like right now. Uh, Andrew, I'm with you. Like, enough people I don't think care. Yeah, I, I I would like to think that this will pick up steam, but I think it's one of the situations where everyone that's going to like be passionate enough to care has already shown up, and now it's just kind of like, oh, let's watch how few people actually care about this show in the grand scheme of things. And I'm excited for the numbers of this show. I'm excited for more information. I'm excited for the people that are going to try to defend this piece of shit. Okay, look, I got to <laughs> be fair. For I the can't... Car video. What'd you say? I'm excited for the car video from one of the actors defending it or, <laughs> or someone associated with it. We had Simon Pegg for She-Hulk. We had Ewan McGregor from Moses um, Ingram. Who are we going to get in, in a car for the Acolyte? Who's going to uh, be defending Amandla? There aren't any white guys to defend, so they're going to have to reach out of their usual box. Oh, here we are, right? Have a here video we're... of Harvey Weinstein from prison defending this show. Perfect. That, that's <laughs> the way to go. That's that. I'll watch that. I'll watch that. That's good television. Um, then you have new. You, then you have jail videos. First of them to make a new thing that trends on on uh, YouTube. People posting YouTube videos from jail. I mean, there were there were like at least two white male characters in that trailer, right? But I just that that to me is such a non-issue. The issue is just Star Wars is boring now. Like they don't Disney doesn't know how to handle Star Wars. They don't know how to make it exciting. They they were handed the golden goose. Like not not even just a golden egg. Like they were handed the goose itself and they just had to let it keep out, you know, keep shitting golden eggs all the time. Like every few years, let it lay something. It's gonna make a zillion dollars. People get excited. People buy the merch. Just let let the machine trust the process. Just let it do its thing. But no, instead, we think we can do better. So we're going to make it do our thing. Well, their thing sucks. Um, nobody likes their thing. Nobody likes their thing. Why? Because uh, they don't put any effort behind it. All of their marketing is like, oh, well, we think it's about time that there were more prominent female characters in Star Wars. What the hell are you talking about? Have you watched Star Wars? There are plenty of prominent female characters in Star Wars, and fans have loved them for decades. Like this is this is a non-issue. It is you are fabricating a dragon to slay right now. Well, are, the the powers of Leslie Headland and Lucasfilm coming together is really making Leslie something Headcase. special. Like think about it. Leslie probably originally wrote the line, "Close your eyes, what do you see?" And the next line was a casting couch. And then Lucasfilm came in and said, "No, no, no, no. That's not what we say in Star Wars." And they switched it. So you're getting the best of both worlds. The Weinstein Miramax world and the Kathleen Kennedy barista Lucasfilm world coming together to create some new atrocity that we've never encountered before. I wouldn't even it's want her bringing fun. me a coffee. I don't know if it's going to be freaking roofy. <laughs> I, I just didn't think that this show was going to actually get to be made because they were like, oh. This is the show without war in Star Wars. This is this. This is that. And I went, this sounds terrible. But here's our first look. And they're really going hard with this one. They, the powers that be, firmly believe that the Acolyte represents what people want for the next era of Star Wars. And I think this is going to be one of those situations where we have, we watch Disney with egg on their face very quickly. Mm -hmm. Because like with the uh, Obi-Wan series where they tried to pump out all this merchandise including a has lab never went anywhere yeah so i think the acolyte's going to be a lot like this and if well, they, uh, i've heard sorry, that they're going to do another has lab soon if they do a has lab based on the acolyte uh that's oh, please <laughs> please i beg of well, you the the please. angle here <laughs> the angle here that it's not a wrong angle but i mean the execution is terrible the angle is that oh we're going to do a story where we're seeing uh, at least that's from the original pitch we're seeing a 
someone learned the ways of the Sith and an intimate in an intimate setting, the way Luke learned in uh, the ways of the Jedi and whatnot. And you're like, on the paper, that sounds like a good idea. But then it's like, well, who's involved in executing that? Oh, it's these people, these ideologues who are actual Sith, half, half parts of, uh, of nepotism, half parts of checkboxes under the leadership that has not changed at a studio for over 15 years. So it's antiquated leadership that's not paying attention to the markets itself. It's just the stubbornness and the ego of their initial ideas. So clearly there's not anything going to be inventive with it. Where if you were to get someone like, for instance, uh, you know, Gary Kurtz were still alive, George Lucas, um, even um, maybe even Michael Arndt <laughs> to, to come in and explore with that idea, you probably might get something that's a bit counter a good counterbalance to understand the Sith and the temptations that this the force have on the dark side so that you can actually have more to explore with it. But I don't think we're gonna get such a you know a cerebral take on, on these things because they're written by people that uh sadly over the last 20 years Hollywood has been so much about the new, the shocking, the and the um and the uh controversial that it's no longer about the thought, the care and and you know the exploration of ideas. Well not just that but Disney's had diminishing returns on the Star Wars shows with each one that they put out. And that at well, this that's point, that's based on the same thing we've just talked about already, right. which is but they're repeating the same. They have great ideas, but they don't know how to execute. Them. They're, they're doing this even with characters that are mostly tried and true and that audiences historically have enjoyed. So considering that diminishing return, um, trajectory has not slowed down or altered even when we're talking about characters like obi-wan kenobi we're talking about ahsoka who i have no particular attachment to but a lot of other people do and the show had piss poor viewership it just keeps getting worse so now they're just instead of like reaching for something to attempt to, I don't know, grasp on to nostalgia, right? Because that's what the Kenobi show was, and that's what Ahsoka was, because there was clearly no effort put into the writing, and certainly not into the performances either. For the most part, they were pretty lame. Now they're just going back to their their tried and true, um, let's just make some shit up and not give audiences a reason to care. So they have even they're going to have even a smaller audience on this one. I think that there is a good chance this has even worse viewership than Ahsoka did. Well, the sad misconception is that you think that the people writing this believe that the audience is, they're doing something that the audience won't care about. No, the sad part is that they think audiences will care about this and they're wrong. <laughs> like that's just it. It's their, their eye on the target. is. Then they're not so looking gone. at any visible data. Of course not. Well, because I for one will, will cry a little that it won't be on the Nielsen charts because that means I can't make videos out of it very often. <laughs> since it won't chart and uh yeah this is gonna have worse than miss marvel ratings there's no doubt do you think that's the uh the goal is to top these shows and they think that it's a good thing like oh we're gonna do bigger numbers than miss marvel it's like that's really not an achievement yeah uh, so i kid like, you not congratulations you won a hundred meter dash against a quadriplegic leslie headland is recorded and she was saying this seriously she's recorded saying that she pitched the frozen idea in space to Kathleen Kennedy. And after she did, the first thing that Kathleen Kennedy asked was, so you want to do a singing snowman in Star Wars? And then Leslie had to explain, no, that l l let me, you know. And that seems and, about right. Is that all and Kathleen Kennedy hired her. <laughs> no, no, that, that, that's exactly how producers respond to when you do a pitch like that. Yep. And Kathleen Kennedy hired her. When your first question is, so you want to do a singing snowman in space? That should be not going well for you as a writer. And instead, Kathleen Kennedy was automatically like, I see where you're going and I like it. Well, it's a race to the bottom. Worst idea wins. I mean, I, then I guess props to them no. for working really hard at at least one thing. In, in that regard, you could say the worst idea. And, and I, in the honest regard, it's like Kathleen Kennedy just doesn't know what good ideas are. Doesn't have a sense of, what works best for this? Sure, she can ask if you want a, a singing snowman, and Leslie can say, "Well, I don't mean the singing part; I mean the sisters part." In which case, that's what Kathy Kenny's eyes light up and be like, "Oh, sisters! Ooh. There we go. That's something I like." Could one and of them look like me? <laughs> We've done that a few times. It works out well. They've and never they had an actor that looks like Kathleen Kennedy. <laughs> and, and then, and then, the, then Leslie said, "No, we're going to make her black." And Kathleen was like, 
Ooh, I see more awards in my future. <laughs> I, I would love to see this show actually get an award. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, it won't get awards. Kathleen will. She'll get she'll get every legacy award you can imagine one day. There'll be an the entire does... year of award circuits for Kathleen. Well, she got that, what is it, the Irving Thur Thalberg or Thur some kind of she got big a BAFTA, I think. Yeah. Okay, she got something big a few years back. Like, but when Kathleen Kennedy gets these awards, it doesn't really change anything. It just the shows continue to get worse. And it... yeah, the shows still suck. Fewer people <laughs> continue to watch them, and the merch doesn't sell. Like, wh why is this person getting an award again? For well, existing? awards are meaningless. I mean, that's that's the sad part. It's basically oh, it's just people a Hollywood in the wrong community jerk. voting for each other. The only time you you're going to know that her career is kind of in the retirement stage is when. AFI gives her the Lifetime Achievement Award. That's so AFI, if you're listening, could you give her the Lifetime Achievement Award this year and speed up the process? Because I think it would lead to a better, brighter future. She's they retired. Won't. She's gone. Yeah, she's gone. So everybody else that she hired is still going to be there. Because oh, I know. I know. There. <laughs> like, that's, that's the thing. I was saying this on the other streams. Sure, you can point fingers at Kathleen Kennedy as the source of the problem, but the problem is, is that she's also created a number of other problems that have now got their hooks inside the franchise. And until you find and identify all of them and get rid of them, they're still going to be there. It's like cancer patient. Oh, we found one tumor. Did you look anywhere else for other tumors? No. So you just got the one. Great. That patient is still going to die. <laughs> so you got to find the rest. You can't just put I, it all I... on her shoulders. Script, do you think that they one day will have to outsource Star Wars so they can empty out all of the bad faith actors inside of Lucasfilm who don't really care about making great product but really care about ideology? They won't even have to outsource it. Once the once you get a new head of the studio, everything changes. That's you think, you think those people can be coerced? You don't think they'll protest and, and do all of their shenanigans? It's, not, it's never worked in the history of Hollywood before. I doubt it would work this time. <laughs> I, listen, I agree with you on that. <laughs> I mean, I'll put it to you this way. When Zaslav came into Warner Brothers, a lot of people, especially of the woke ideology, protested. And guess what? They don't work at Warner Brothers anymore. Yeah. They, they, and, they, and the ones that didn't protest. That's a great point. The ones that didn't protest that are the ideology still do, but they've also gone out publicly and said dumb stuff. And now we know that their time at that studio is coming to an end. Their contracts aren't going to be renewed. And, and in some cases, some departments of theirs have been downsized to the point where they're going to be ineffective and eventually shuttered once people stop paying attention to what those um, DEI stuff are actually doing anymore. Mm. Hmm. I, I, I'm looking forward to that future. <clears throat> Excuse me. Well, I mean, it's going to be everywhere else in Hollywood. It, so long as Bob Iger's still in charge at Disney, it's not going anywhere. Well, it's because, not going anywhere until the 2030s then because Bob Iger is not going to leave. He's got seven years yeah. of guaranteed consultation work that keeps oh. him in an office next to the CEO through, like I said, through 2030. He'll never leave. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And that CEO is going to know if I step out of line with Bob, not only am I going to lose my shower, but uh, I'm going to get Bob Chay picked right out the door. Yeah. Oh, exactly. And it, it's. I, I was hard pressed to try and think of another studio head that has had a tenure as long as Bob Iger's in the studio system, because they usually it's usually like maybe a decade on average at best, especially when things go well, rarely does it get over that. Um, and Bob Iger, he's going to be a, by when it's all said and done, he's going to have been at Disney in a leadership uh, capacity over 20 years. He's the Greg Popovich of, uh, of entertainment CEOs it just won't go, go away. away. Yeah. I mean, as you know, I don't wish any ill will, physical ill will to um, Bob Iger, but if he happens to pass away before that 2030 point, uh, that's one, that's one way to help clean up Disney, Disney, sadly. <laughs> it's not, it's not the most ideal. We're not rather, wishing that a hippo will sit on him. him. I want him to be, I want him to retire and I want the about face <laughs> that Disney takes once he's gone to happen so that he can actually see, Oh, it was all his fault. Right. Well, the, the, <laughs> just the, the problem to piggyback on that, the problem extends beyond just Kathleen Kennedy. Obviously, we know that Kathleen Kennedy has made hirings within Lucasfilm and therefore those people also need to go. So it needs to be how it is in a lot of cases when it comes to smaller box retail stores where new management comes in and everybody else either like leaves or they stick around for a brief time and then they get canned or they 
that new manager just comes in and said, nope, I'm clearing out this entire store and we are starting from scratch, right? And I'm doing things my way and I'm bringing in people that I'm going to make sure trained my way. And that can be a very effective strategy. And that's what's going to need to happen for Lucasfilm. But beyond even that, that can't even happen until Iger's gone. That right. I just don't see that happening until Iger's gone because Iger is there. It's not just Iger, but with Iger there, none of the other changes are happening. Yeah, he, he's got control of the board. He has control of a number of the departments that he's uh, made hires for, including the Disney one, Disney film, uh, di sorry, Lucasfilm. Uh, the, the only thing that you could do is once he is gone, you'd pull like the Arrested Development uh, technique that uh, the Blue family would do, where you get all your current employees to pack up everything and say, we're going to a new office. Then you end up uh, having them unload everything. And then you say, oh, yeah, by the way, you guys are all fired. So you use free labor to move all the equipment over. And now you've got new people coming into the new office. And uh, they don't have keys to it. So they can't get in and get all their stuff or effects. That that would be the the most appropriate way that any new management happens at, at the Walt Disney Corporation. But sadly, that it's not going to be anytime soon. Guilty desire? I would like for the Ray movie to come out before Bob leaves because I would like for Bob to experience a film that makes him reminisce for the days oh. of the Marvels. <laughs> <laughs> you think oh, it'll be that man. bad? Yes, oh. I think it would be Revenge of the Fan. It yeah. would It would be. That is if they end up pulling the trigger to actually go 100% through it because they've, number one, they've already gone ghostly silent. And number two, if they were to go in production this year, well, they're butting up against an IAT, a possible IATSE strike. And guess they're, what they're studio is the one that's going to kind of guarantee that strike? It's Walt Disney Company, not the other ones. The other ones are probably going to be starting drafting up interim agreements and doing anything they can to maintain any of the productions they, they want because they've suffered quite harshly last year. But Walt Disney, uh, ugh, they You know they what's, you know what's interesting about that? This gets in the weeds script, so apologies, but I'll just do it for a minute. The, the, the really interesting thing about the Yahtzee strike, and you're right, Disney basically controls where this thing goes, is that if there is even a three-day strike of the Yahtzee, uh, we're hearing that Disney would pull the trigger to delay Moana 2. It would give them the excuse they need on delaying a film that has six months of production. And Disney animated musicals usually have five years of yep. gestation and preparation. This one has six months. And if, if Yahtzee happens, Yahtzee, um, then Disney would be able to move that. And perhaps even, script. this is really interesting, perhaps even the next Captain America, which is scheduled to still be filming in their reshoots all the way through August. When does IA potentially go on strike? Uh, August. Next well, Captain America. Oh, the negotiations start back? in early, early May. But uh, given the, the patterns of how this, how some of the studios have walked away quite early, the strike might be a lot earlier. But one of the things I, I do know is that some of the stuff that Sony's got in production this year and Warner Brothers, they basically said, as long as whatever proposed IATSE is not unreasonable, and so far the, the stuff that I have heard is pretty rational, um, pretty in par with what they've already agreed to on the writer side of things and a little bit better than what's done on the actor side, um, I think they'll be happy to do it because... Number one, they don't want interruptions in their productions this year. It's it's not the case. Disney could very well use a couple of interruptions in their productions this year. So I, I think we're probably going to get uh it's gonna be really weird. I wish it was it was predictable, but it's just it's all over the place right now. Uh I know Zaslav doesn't want to interrupt Superman, uh the Superman movie and the other two Warner Brothers he's got in production. Sony has got a couple of things. I think they're trying to get the uh, the next starting the next trilogy of Spider-Man films they want to start doing um, this year in production. See if that's going to happen or not. I don't know. Um, so yeah, there's they have a lot on the line. The studios have a lot more on the line this year because of the the strikes last year. That they're it would be smart for them to play ball, but Disney has not been very smart the last few years. So I don't know how well it's going to be be the case. What do you think Sony's thinking after Ghostbusters bad response from critics, but just pretty decent response from uh, fans? Do you think they think Ghostbusters had a lifespan beyond uh, this movie? Is it doing okay in theaters, money wise? It's, I think it's, it's number one, right? It's it's number one, and it's not up it, against much right now, right? Yeah, 
uh, Godzilla X Con is definitely going to take a huge chunk out of it. Might knock it down to number two or three. Um, nice language. That was well played. That was, that was, yeah. no, <laughs> I'm, I'm quite Got proud. It. I'm quite, I'm yep. quite proud. That's why he's the script doctor, folks, and you're not. <laughs> so the, the thing is, is that right now with Sony, so Sony did a, a really smart thing uh, two years ago, right after Ghostbusters and Spider-Man No Way Home hit. They pre-sold the stuff that would be coming out in 2023, 2024, and 2025 for a massive amount because they had those two blocks, box office uh, and critically received, positively critically received films under their belt. They basically said, yes, Madam Web, Craven, Venom 3, um, Spider-Verse, and uh, Ghostbusters are all going to be in this huge package that we're going to sell internationally on the territories. And they probably got uh, an average between two to seven million per territory. And if you multiply that by 50, uh, that covers a lot of production costs and not include, not necessarily including the budget, uh, sorry, the advertising. Marketing, yeah. So they don't have to make as much of a margin in order to consider themselves in a fair situation. Um, clearly Madam web is going to be the highest loss leader out of them all because it's, it's, I don't even think it broke a hundred million worldwide yet. So, no. No, so that you know, movie sorry made for them nothing. on that part. <laughs> but I think Ghostbusters, uh, if it ends up legging out a little bit, uh, which it might, might do, it probably will make um, it's enough money back. And with the fan critical reception being in the, and then mostly positive, it might re cause Sony to reevaluate and be like, okay, we know exactly what the budget limit is going to be for these films in order for us to actually justify continuing it. It's not going to be the budget of frozen empire. It's going to be the budget of afterlife. And that's what you get if you want to continue. No. And I think, I think the Reitman's uh, uh, the Reitman and Aykroyd and co over at ghost corp will be ha more than happy to acquiesce to that. If they get them to continue ghostbusters oh, yeah. films and other stuff. And I think that's most likely going to be the case. And, and if they reduce the uh, cast, they they could make a much better movie. That they just need oh, to yeah. reduce the cast and uh, make the make the script more concentrated on an A story, a B story, and let's be done. But I, I don't want to lose this moment strip because I'm I'm curious if you've heard anything inside the industry uh, related to Ghostbusters: Frozen Empire, but only tangentially. I'm hearing that uh, McKenna Grace is looking like she's going to be cast as Zelda in the live action uh, Zelda film. Have you heard anything about that? No, that's news to me. I mean, she's a natural blonde and she's a good actor, so she could probably do it. I think, I think it's a phenomenal casting. I, I heard it and I said, that is out of this world. Good. I hope they pull it off. Who's, who do you want nice. to see Link go up against? Uh, Cause I guess you got to keep Link in the same age range. So I guess that ages out. Everybody wanted Tom Holland. He'd be way yeah, too you're gonna old, have though. to find a, a young actor like in around late teens, early twenties, because I think McKenna's going to be twenty soon in the next well, year. Or I, I just heard that Timothy uh, Chalamet is going to be in every single film, so I guess he, I guess he's default de facto uh, link. That's unfortunate because he's he's okay <laughs> of an actor, but he's he doesn't have the magic jelly for people. He's no, he's he actually doing something that's quite tragic. Script. The magic he appeals of course. to a generation of women that have been poorly raised, and I know this because my godson. <laughs> My godson was talking to me earlier this week. He he went on those dating apps. My godson, this is what's interesting. My godson is a licensed carpenter and he's a licensed plumber and he's getting his electrician's license to become a handyman and start his own business, which a lot of women would say, wow, those are very useful skills. I'll never have to pay for any uh, hard labor to maintain my house ever in my life if I were to And be script, English. after your experiences today, you can also appreciate the trades. Yeah, well, yeah, because that's why I, I learned some of those as well. I'm not licensed to do it, but I, I can definitely not screw it up worse. But when he was, he, he's, I mean, of this generation, you only date through apps. And he's a good looking kid, but not a single girl is interested in a guy that knows how to do stuff. They're interested in a guy that's got social media clout and cred. And it's like, if that's what all women are interested in now, especially the, the target audience that Timothy Chalamet appeals to, uh, yeah, I can, I, I understand why the, the, uh, birth rates are down and why priorities and, and, and social media gains and, and stuff like that is up. Well, Timothy, Timothy Chalamet, Chalamet also not, looks like he doesn't have a Y chromosome. No, he does. He looks, he looks very beta and like nothing against the guy personally. Like I, I haven't watched him in anything. So, I, but I can just like, based on his photos, I'm like, you have a very like fragile looking jaw. <laughs> He does, and uh, and you know what? The one, he, here's the other part too. Will he go the same way of um, gosh, who's that uh, actor who is in Weird Science and the um, uh, the TV show uh that of the Christopher Walken film where you can see Anthony Michael Hall. 
Anthony mm. Michael Hall. Anthony Michael Hall was a very feminine looking boy in the early eighties, but then he beefed up as an adult in the late, in the mid to late nineties. And now he's kind of like, you know, and he looks like a man finally. <laughs> Could Timothy Chalamet do that? I think so. But if he does, he might lose all those girls that like twinks. And, <laughs> and, and you know what? As weird as it sounds, they uh... they find ways to make money and they do drive certain aspects of a market, even though it's not much. It's better than the nothing that's currently already existing right now with other people. Because you even got Glenn Powell, who he's like 35, tall, blonde, in shape. He's got a little buzz around him, but not Timothy Chalamet buzz, but 20 years ago, if he was at that age, that peak, he would be dwarfing Bradley Cooper. People would be forgetting who he was, who Bradley Cooper yeah. was and be like, Glenn Powell's the guy. Glenn. Um, he was, he was in uh talk on Maverick, right? Yep. Talk on Maverick. He was in anyone and one, but you, and he's also in the twister sequel that's coming out. Oh, that right. looks terrible. Ooh, the guy. He, it he does. actually looks like somebody I would, I would legitimately be okay. Casting as like Barry Allen. Like, a yeah, he'd be, he'd be pretty good at, at a Barry Allen. Yeah. Like he he uh, looks like a proper Barry Allen. He uh he was solid in Top Gun. That's the only thing I knew him from. So yeah, he's good. I know I'd, I'd seen his face like for trailers for other things, but Top Gun Maverick's the only thing I've actually seen seen him in. Listen, all I can tell you guys is I saw a video of Chuck Norris. He's eighty one. He's still out there doing martial arts. Uh, the man is pure masculinity. So what we need to do <laughs> is the next time 81-year-old Chuck Norris, who looks like he's about 52, the next time he goes out in the morning to do his martial arts, we just need to get some of those beautiful, divine Chuck Norris sweat drippings and sprinkle it onto the betas out there and just watch what happens. They will suddenly oh, nice. sprout a couple It'll be like things. miracle grow, huh? Yeah, that... yeah, it'll happen. They'll they'll have an urge to roundhouse kick. A weed killer, who knows? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well, yeah. Somebody's gonna contort. They'll melt. It'll be like a wicked witch, you know. Yeah, I'm melting. Yeah, what a great movie that you really can't remake. But they, what they try? They make two sequels of that movie. There was a Return of the Oz, and then there was uh, oh, that's was right. There was the one, one. What was the one with James Franco? James, uh, the Sam Raimi one. Um. That was just Oz, the great power. Was that just yeah. Oz? Yeah. I didn't ac actually end up seeing that one. Like, I remember starting it on TV and then just doing something else. <laughs> now, let's check in with the audience before we keep talking some other topics, uh, because they are here and awesome folks. We have about 400 people watching across our platform. So Woo! just to show you how YouTube changes that up. Uh as we have new life across other platforms. Welcome in, folks. But uh, thank you to everybody watching. Hit that thumbs up button. And if you're watching on X, hit retweet. That'd be That's what we do on X. Re retweet us, folks. It doesn't matter retweet. if you have a million followers or anyone. Hit that retweet button, and that'll help us go up in the algorithm even more. So if you want to help, that's the way to help. Taylor Swift, greater than Disney Stars MC, says, Today is the anniversary of the final WCW Nitro. Oh. So I know where I was 23 years ago then. Um, I was in my living room watching Nitro because I, for some reason, decided I was going to start watching WCW. And Vince McMahon was on there. And he bought the WCW and <laughs> promptly canceled Nitro. So that was my one and only Nitro. <laughs> and Your first was... live Nitro was the one where it was Vince buying <laughs> Yeah. It. Wow. We, I, had, uh, I loved wrestling. I had... We watched SmackDown on over-the-air terrestrial TV, and then we got direct TV at the end of the year 2000. And I was so pumped for watching Raw, I, was, I didn't even think about Nitro. And I was like, wait a second, that's an hour before. I can watch the first Nitro. I can watch Nitro for an hour, then watch Raw, then go to sleep. And I guess that wasn't meant to be. So Booker T and all the like at uh, WCW, I'm glad you eventually came to the WWE. Uh, so Georgian says you missed my super chat last week sorry about that Sir Georgian uh, for the word of the day and didn't cover the James Bond rumors not cool Jeff not cool well Sir Georgian I apologize for that last week we had our guest on and the show kind of went all over the rails but uh, if you'd like to pick another word of the day for next week's show we'd love to give that to you and if you give me a second what we'll do here is I will uh, since we always do this for a higher tier let's Go ahead and dedicate something from the shelf to you. Since you brought up James Bond, I got this uh, little Daniel Craig. So there you go. Uh, you'll, he'll be named Sir Georgian from now on. And he, lives, <laughs> and he lives among the X-Men. Here he goes. He's hanging out with Magneto and Mystique. 
But thank you, Sir Georgian, for your patience, and uh, I'd like to make that right for you. Shrubbles08 says, the word of the day is swallow. Uh, Ernest does swallow. Electric boogaloo. Uh, fistful of swallows. Stop or my swallow will shoot. Uh, and her well, swallows. <laughs> well, how about instead of it follows, it There's swallows. There's a whole lot going on here. <laughs> yeah. Three days of the swallows? Wow. I don't want to say this. Powers, almost. international <laughs> man of swallows? Mm. I feel like you missed one right here. Uh, Shrubbles08, you said, uh, what was it? Stop or my swallow will shoot. It's stop or my mom will swallow. That's the next oh, one. No. You know, <laughs> oh, Come on, no. man. I'm just like, you got all these great ones that you're just leaving on the table. Take the low hanging fruit. Make us do the hard work. Uh, all right. We got swallow or swallows. Um, Club swallow. Uh, all the president swallows. Yeah. Major swallow. breakfast swallow. <laughs> Oh, I got a weird mind. Anyway, uh, Shrimblezoid, yeah. thank you very much for all of these. Uh, Jack White says, Disney under Iger just doesn't know how to make good anything, and it just ain't Star Wars. And new series recommendation, solo leveling. Uh, let me take a screenshot of that, Jack. I have been watching videos on Japanese artists. Was it Junji Ito? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, yeah, that was that's a fascinating master. one. Yeah. Uh, very interesting because I told you I'm working on this big thing uh, beyond Wokebusters and part of it is to study everything in terms of comics because I feel like this two things make you an interesting artist life experiences and knowing your craft and well I've done a lot of travel and lived all over lately so life's been experiencing a lot of different things but you're never uh, too good to learn doesn't matter what you do so that's why I've been watching uh, videos on manga artists just to learn nice more but thank you jack john thomas says boo freaking who a bunch of execs got laid off i mean there's my tear for him I, I i don't have any of those i don't know where you put those do they make me money uh jack white says some space series recommendations to hopefully fill that star wars hole <laughs> eden zero star blazers and gundam i know those ones Star Blazers, Space Battleship, and uh, Yamato. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, My buddy Joel is big into that. That's so, uh, Captain Harlock. Jack White always has great recommendations. Jack does. I'd like to thank you, Jack, for all of your recommendations. Dion and I are going to come up with, I want to call it the $5 anime show and put it over on Patreon as a joke. But either way, I'm going to come up with a Patreon show where Dion and I experience anime that we've never watched before. And after we build up a little back catalog, maybe we'll put some of them on YouTube. And you can just watch two dudes that don't really know anime. Watch anime and give you some natural reactions. I may be an artist, but it doesn't mean I've seen everything that's out there. So it's always fascinating to uh, consume new stuff. So Jack, thank you. If you There's combine the these with the word of the day, you get Eden Swallows, Star Swallows, yeah. and, well... Gundam. There's there's Gundam. swallowed. No What's doubt. interesting is I think the creator of One Piece, uh, I, I hope this quote is accurate, but they released a quote saying, I'm gonna take some time off and actually start to figure out what the one piece actually is. And if I and I said to myself, if that if that is true, that is basically Asian storytelling in a nutshell. They start the story, have no idea where it's going, and it and you <laughs> can tell. Um well, a lot of the, the with, land with how competitive <laughs> is JJ Abrams secretly Japanese? Is that what you're saying, script? Well, with how competitive <laughs> and cutthroat the, the manga scene is in Japan, um, a lot of these mangakas will, like, have an arc or two, like, mapped out, planned out, solid, and not necessarily have any expectations beyond that. And then all of a sudden, if, you know, Shonen Jump says, hey, we need more of, the, more of this, or whatever studio decides to pick it up as an animation, then all of a sudden they're like, "Oh shit, uh, I hadn't planned much beyond this, so now I've got to now I got to sort this out." Um, Dragon Ball was that way. Oh, it could, Dra I could Dragon tell. Ball Z was <laughs> mapped out strongly um, as a narrative through the Namek saga, but it was just so gosh darn popular they wanted more and more and more, which is why 
the adventuring <laughs> well it's why not necessarily just that but it's why the adventuring takes a bit of a backseat and it just really becomes more of a power scaling thing where it's like oh we just got to get more powerful for the next bad guy that got more powerful than the last guy that we had to fight blah 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 and it's still fun to watch and it didn't hurt his popularity that's for sure but mm -hmm. that's just how it is in the manga market that's why the vast majority of uh mangas and animes are only a couple of seasons like it, your dragon balls your one pieces sailor moon things like that naruto those bleach those are like those are the rarities that wind up going that long where they're like you know three four hundred episodes and whatnot i i just i don't have time for those ever oh i, I sure as hell don't have time for the three and four hundred episode ones anymore like i could maybe knock out a uh a 26 episode single season thing like in a month maybe half a month if i was really diligent about watching but i i just don't have the free time to watch those long form ones anymore i just don't have the desire to watch anything that long like anything honestly there's no kind of narrative that i'm interested to commit that much time to I, even stuff that i know i like like dragon ball z i haven't seen every episode and to go and say oh i'm gonna watch dragon ball then dragon ball z then we'll skip gt and super and all these other ones like i know that's a huge commitment i just and i know i like the show i just don't have any interest in that kind of a commitment uh other things are more fascinating to me these days but i i'm always down to watch new stuff and give it a shot so what i'm saying is i won't jump into a show that i know is 400 episodes just because it's long but if i'm watching something new that's awesome and it keeps going on then i'm gonna yeah. keep watching it like, well that's what naruto that's was for me like i started that when it literally originally started airing like from from chapter one in shonen jump from episode one on the anime and then i wound up just continuing with it until it finished whereas like if i hadn't started that back then when i was you know junior high and high school and i was just now hearing about it and deciding oh maybe i'll check it out and then i saw how long it was i'd be like no i'm good actually uh two more real quick and then we're gonna get back to some other segments tonight uh taylor swift says did you get the super chats from thursday's stream well taylor swift greater than disney star wars mc we didn't actually broadcast on thursday that was a pre-recorded episode uh that we told you guys about so uh we will read anything that rolled in on this thursday show at the very beginning because now we're live but because of our new youtube growth we've noticed that we don't want to have any gaps or delays so even if we have to do a pre-recorded show it's better than not doing a show because it used to be oh it's convention week no show bye guys we're yeah. traveling because nick and the guys are on en route but now we just want to youtube and takes you a, a big old one. shit on your algorithm growth uh-huh well we're about the we're whooping its ass so thank you mm. um other platforms man it's all about eyes so there we go troubles await says i'll take another one in a buffalo jeff oh the new buffalo jeff cool mm -hmm. well i'm glad i get to press that one because that's one of my favorites but here's your first one Another one. Another one. Another one. Another one. Another one. And here's another one. Who's that Pokemon? Who's that Pokemon? Me, your old pal Buffalo Jeff. That one's great. I love that you you had it to where the the glowing red eyes linger. That's amazing. Best part is that was a happy accident. Was it really? Yeah, I. They're two separate graphic elements that you overlay. Yeah, uh, and so I watched it. And then I was like, oh, shit, the thing's too long. And I'm like, wait, that's kind of creepy looking. So I it is creepy. That a little longer. I and I was like, well, yeah, there you go. Yeah. Look, I think I should work into getting into horror in some way because I'm good at making people uncomfortable across <laughs> the board. I have not. Either like this. with unsettling voices or weird imagery or just an odd scenario that really makes you think. Like I should get somehow get more involved in creating horror because... I feel like I'd be good at it. I, 
I, I pay attention to the next level of detail that really messes with people. So there we go. But uh, thank you, Shrevels08. What would you say? I said I feel like you might be onto something there. Yeah. Well, uh, be on the lookout for my horror comic next Halloween, folks. Who knows? Uh, but be on the lookout for Wokebusters very soon. Uh, people are asking what kind of women does Buffalo Jeff date? Unsuspecting. <laughs> <laughs> That's horrible. <laughs> That's a great answer. <laughs> Jeez. Uh, you know, you gotta uh, you gotta be honest here. Uh shout out to our pal in the chat. Uh it's Chad. Uh check out his channel. Uh congratulations, buddy. Thanks for all the hard the years of your service and congratulations on everything, man. So uh hopefully we get to stream together soon. Now I got my toy set up. I want to do a big toy collector stream. Talking about the state of toys. How long do we think Hasbro is going to be around? There's a lot to cover. So, uh, you know, join us. I'm all in to watch that. Oh, dude, it'll be a lot of fun. I, I have a lot to say about collecting. Believe me, uh, we have all I, kinds of I wonderful things. Now, I wanted to ask uh, Pro. So, let's see. Uh, if you're reading the back channel, you can't say that out loud. That's that's why oh, I'm no, no, no. silent for a moment. Oh, of course I wouldn't do that. I was going to ask you a question. I thought that it ended with, I have to leave right this second. Uh, I wanted to ask you this. We're talking about Disney and numbers. Uh, We've heard all about X-Men 97 and its positive review scores. It's too early to see any of the needle moving, correct? Oh, yeah. Uh, They they only have the first two episodes out until, what, tomorrow or Friday is when the next... So tomorrow is the third episode, and they've... (laughs) In their in their Disney style ignorance, they tried to uh, puff up their chest, and they accidentally told us something they probably don't want us to know. So they they released this announcement that it's the biggest animated show they've had in two or three years. Then they also told us the viewership, which was four million. Now, what that means is, which they may not have intended to relay to us. We now know that all of their other animated stuff has been under 4 million views in the first week. So let's let's just run the numbers for a moment, okay? So let's say right now, and I don't have the I don't have the actual Disney Plus subscribers worldwide in front of me, but let's let's say that they have because this makes easy math. It's my understanding that somewhere around 140 million. But let's like this is gonna make it easier on Disney. Let's drop it to 120. I promise this will actually make it better for Disney. What is four into 120 as a percentage, guys. So if, in, in other words, if there are 120 million Disney Plus subscriber accounts and there are four million viewers, what percentage, Andrew? It'd be 30, right? No, no, no. Not, no. So, so out of 120 total, there's four. What percentage are actually viewing into that? Oh, 120. Sorry. Right, right, right. So oh, it would be uh, 3%. Point, three, yeah. Right. So 3%. That's what they're declaring, and this is the big victory, right? 3% of all subscribed accounts tuned into X-Men 97. Now, for me, I don't think that's a big victory because I look at things like Wednesday and Squid Games and Stranger Things and Cobra Kai, and I see the percentage of individuals watching those Netflix shows as a total of all Netflix subscribers, and I say, hmm, that looks like a success. But you get a ton of people that'll renew their Netflix just for Cobra Kai. Right. So then when you say X-Men 97 beat out all of your other animated stuff with 3% of your total accounts viewing it, um, maybe you shouldn't have said that part. And they're not including Bluey in that, correct? No, they're not because Bluey is independently made. and But it the, is animated, uh, yeah. Script, I don't remember in the... In the I, I know that in the announcement, they put a caveat that excluded Bluey, but I don't remember exactly what the caveat was, but we kind of laughed about it when we saw it. Because <laughs> I'm trying to think, what other cartoons did uh, has Disney Plus put out? Bad Batch, right? Oh, yeah. That, I guess that Marvel's, was... Yeah. Marvel's What If. Marvel's mm-hmm. What If. Oh, I forgot about them. News Fest. Uh, which is apparently getting a second season. <laughs> yeah, which what is if? a weird... No, they, they've already done the second season. They're on their third. Oh, are they in the third? Wow. Yeah. Okay. I only saw like the first two episodes of the first season. Though. I was like, this is a snooze fest. I'm good. I just didn't like the uh, the style of it. I mean, I like the Marvel What If 
uh, concept, but I thought that it just, I don't know, it just felt weird. It's like a and, cell shading, but not type of style. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, that's my complaint with this new X-Men show. It's like it's, those 3D models just st stick out like a sore thumb. It's yeah. weird. Yeah. And I understand, look at, I understand the production of comics and cartoons and all of these things. So I always take that information into account when I critique or judge these things. But there's this layer of work they are skipping out on where everything looks like a 3D model and it doesn't blend well in an animated world anymore. Mm -hmm. And so it just like looks like a flash cartoon. Remember how that used to look where they take like a static JPEG and then they would animate the thing over the top and so it would yeah. look kind of weird. There was a shot in this X-Men cartoon where they're doing like a, I guess, a, uh, mid, a fairly close up shot of Beast. And it just, it looks like a cheap cartoon. And I'm thinking to myself, like, the show is solid. I'm enjoying myself, but there's just these like holes in quality work. And I do feel that it's a cheap looking show on top of just, you know, on top that of that voice acting. For the yeah. A little and bit so, of flash animation style too, like old school flash cartoons. Remember those yeah. in the early days of YouTube? Mm -hmm. I, I miss those days on the internet. Like what was it? Newgrounds and all those things you go there and watch. <laughs> yeah. God, run, run star hero and all that <laughs> oh dude i remember home star runner yeah i remember home star runner, star runner. Sorry, yes i used to i used to ride the bus to high school because my first year i went to this private school i hated it but uh all the kids on the bus talked about home star runner and i went and i watched it and i was like this is the dumbest shit i've ever seen and i just i never got into that one i couldn't get uh i don't know i couldn't get that one but anyway um it's interesting that th it's three percent for disney because Last week, we had uh, Master of the TDS on talking about bots. And the way the hype from the press is and the people uh, people on social media is it sounds like this show is the second coming. Uh, you know, I did review it, and I enjoyed it enough to keep reviewing it each week. Uh, we're, we basically play the game here, where does it shit the bed? And when it shits the bed, maybe then we, we kind of ignore the show. But we're not there yet. We're only on the third episode tonight. And has anyone here watched it? Yes. I haven't seen it yet, no. Have not what yet. Think? What do you think, script? Uh, I think it was relatively on par with the cheesiness of the original 90s show. Uh, the only thing that threw me off was the effeminate model for Magneto. Yeah, it was weird, especially that like bodysuit, but I find it interesting, script, and you'll understand the same thing with you, Andrew. It's a lot of people's criticisms of the show come from their like their lack of reading the comics. And I'm not <laughs> saying that you have to read comic books to enjoy stuff, but I don't think you're that the the general consensus of not knowing stuff from the books is enough to tear down the show. It's almost kind of like, wait, you like that the old cartoon would take from the comics. So when this takes from comics from the similar era. You don't like it because you haven't read the book. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's really a criticism of the show or a lack of, you know, playing ignorance knowledge. is what it is. Yeah. And yeah. so basically, I've spent a whole week reading a lot of really bad takes on the cartoon that, while not this great, like, godsend of a cartoon, doesn't really have a lot of the things I'm seeing people claim that it has. And I watch this thing with a very cautious eye, it doesn't go over my head. You know, a lot of the people that are critiquing this stuff, we've been around longer, all right? I haven't lost any of the critical edge or eye that I take into these things. Mm -hmm. But I'm still waiting for this show to really kind of, you know, turn into what everyone's worried about their script. I mean, well, do you I, think... actually, well, I okay. went back to watch second season of the original X-Men because I noticed a lot of people pointing out, oh, look, the Friends of Humanity are really diverse. And I, I distinctly remember that there were like brown and black Friends of Humanity in the nineties. And there were, I double checked, there weren't any women, but there's definitely people who are like Latin and brown skinned and, and darker skinned and obviously pale white skinned too. And I'm thinking, okay, so aside from the fact that they added women more prominently in the friends of humanity, it seems to be on point with that. Uh, I think the, the, the story that they're adapting from the X-Men comics is, was a big swing and a miss because it did, did not do well. I mean, the whole clone gene gray thing and, that what came from that that was yeah madeline Pryor. Well, that's that, madeline Pryor. Is, yeah is that's uh that's a very forward. convoluted and complex way of linking the summers family to cable and, and all that malarkey but you know it, it happens so they're gonna take a swing at it good for them <laughs> but yeah it's uh the question being is like well if this 
if this proceeds to maintain that level of quality, the 90s quality that it's basing itself off of all the way to the end of this first season, in terms it does of writing, raise, yeah. it does raise other questions as to, well, what was the real impetus for getting rid of that showrunner mm-hmm. who shepherded this? Was it actually the, the only fan stuff? Was it maybe the fact that they were expecting one thing and they got something completely different, got very upset with the final product because they weren't supervising it. And now that they released it and it's doing well, they basically have to weather whatever storm that will be, or who knows, because it's, it's it basically, we have to wait for the rest of the episodes to come out before we can truly get a, a good bearing on what's going on. And, and as for the bots side of things, bots are being used. The, the question being is like, are they actually making anything trending and on social media? And so far, the way I've seen the trending metrics, nothing Disney or really Marvel has has actually done the top 10 trending as you'd expect for some sort of new property. So it means that whoever is operating this bot farm, whether it's Disney, whether it's a group of very um, well financed fans or maybe a crazy person that works in production that's doing it themselves because they they want to try and get some more points within Disney itself. Who knows? Well, those connections have not been formed yet. Uh, I would say, I'd argue the effectiveness is actually almost negligible. It's almost like they're just burning money and resources because if you're able to game the system to get tons of views but little interaction, Twitter's not going to reward you for that. Mm-hmm. Well, like old well, Twitter might have, but not current Twitter. Well, I just wanted to hear what you guys, uh, your takes on all of this stuff, because uh, we're in the the beginnings of this show, and I feel like a lot of <clears throat> Disney shows kind of hit this life cycle. Well, good. I do plan uh, on checking it out, um, mostly because of your review, Jeff, because you're one of the few people that I trust to be pretty uh, um, objective and honest. And I know you also have familiarity with source materials, so I'm I'm willing to take you at your word when you're reviewing something. So. You're one of the few people that gave it a, a like at least on the writing side like a thumbs up and you were honest about the issues you had with it like the voice acting for a lot of the characters is not up to snuff um mm-hmm. you know and then the the 3d models which i already just based on some of the footage that i'd seen those were already weird to me so it doesn't that's no big surprise to me i don't like that they're doing that i wish it was just clean 2d animation but that's not what it is. But gotta, if the writing is solid, then um, I'm willing to at least give it a give it a shot. You got to ask yourself this. Now, I I care more about the animation than I'll even let on here. Like, of course, but going back to watch the 90s animation, you it it doesn't hold up. Like there are certain. Oh, no, 90s Marvel shows new. don't hold up well at all. But, uh, you know, this one looks fine like this new one but like this i don't think there's an, enough stuff out there being animated in a way i like anyway like i would like for it to have that buttery smoothness and style of some of the warner brothers direct video animation i like their new style a lot of people say it's boring a lot of people shit on it i think some of those newer like uh well not the killing joke um long halloween i thought the long halloween looked interesting i liked the style that they've created it's like a hybrid classic Hanna barbera meets you know modernized whatever where it's like realistic proportions cartoony faces a very stylized but like you know recognizable thing i wish x-men was a little more like that where it felt like it had weight it this a lot of times it just looks like cgi moving through cgi and you know that's it that's that's my big complaint folks i'll be back uh to review it tomorrow morning i'll get up i'll get my pot of coffee i'll record the review and put that out there for you guys to watch tomorrow as we keep saying i keep bringing more and more stuff to you guys all the time marvel's so actually you like doing it, a, we'll do it oh sorry 90 or marvel's also doing like a prelude uh mini series comic mini series on x-men 97 as well that's supposed to take place in between in between the original 90s series and this i actually added that to my poll list uh, today I'm gonna I'm gonna check that out and see if it's any good. The interior art looks solid, so I'm. Gonna, yeah, I'm gonna um, I think you know what people should understand too is a lot of like the art with X Men '97 across the board. It's trying to look a certain way, mm-hmm. and so I'll give it the nod. Like if you look at the original X Men cartoon to the X Men Adventures co- comic book, you know you can tell that they're trying to mimic that style, but they don't necessarily get it like a one to one. 
This one looks like a slightly cleaned up version of the cartoon. So I'm I'm digging it. I personally will read it online for free because I don't, you know, my stance on all this is I will read tons of comic books. I will buy independent comic books, no problem, because there's that deserves the money. But like, oh no, a new Spider-Man book. Let me just read it online. If I like it, then I'll go out and pick up a book to support the penciler. But you know, I'm not I'm not rushing out to spend money on anything from Marvel. Sorry, like that, that's as that's as upfront as I can be. But folks, you guys should do uh, you know, do what you do. Um thank you, Bat Goat. Uh things have been so much better, and I'm enjoying all of this stuff. So I'm glad you guys are seeing that response. Uh I always say how lucky I am, so I continue to say that. So thank you for noticing the change. Um, anything else you guys want to say about the X-Men 97 or any of the stuff we've discussed before we talk about what Pro has in the uh, the back room? Because uh, this is interesting news, and I breaking. thought, you know, breaking mm -hmm. news, and I thought the audience loves breaking news, so why not give them something they can't hear anywhere else? Sure. I, I just want to say that... Uh... While companies like Disney have certainly trained us to uh, have knee-jerk reactions to things, we don't need to make shit up to make fun of things. Because a lot of times, th they end up shooting themselves in the foot anyway and giving us plenty of reasons to make fun of them. We don't need to fabricate things that aren't I'm there. And X-Men 97 is a testament to that. Thanks for saying that, because I do... It and it's people that I know personally, they get so riled up by a lot of this stuff. And I get it. Like folks, I'm not here to try to tell you that Disney's great or Disney's yeah. whatever. All there I'm saying is, no, is no, no, it's not even good. Like I, I stand by what I say. I practice what I preach, but you know, give yourself the opportunity to experience things before you might buy into some of the rhetoric that's being put out there. Because in the case of the X-Men, it's just, not really there it, it's funny how the people that want to say it represents all of these extra things kind of makes fun of them because it talks about you know how you x-men the humans and mutants it's the mutants that need to do better to integrate with society it's not this anti whatever and so if these other groups see themselves as the mutants the other well then it they put the onus on themselves to do better, <laughs> to do better. A, yeah so <laughs> it's one of those situations where i'm like if you're watching it from my point of view, it's kind of slapping a lot of that in the face. Be I'm better, like, Senator. Oh. Yeah. Because <laughs> I watched it, I was like, wait, is the X-Men going against this shit? Like, like they look like the Jim Lee X-Men. They kind of sound like it. They got the music. Is the message almost on point? And I'm like, hey, there we go. Um, <laughs> oh, we got somebody in the chat saying Andy Kubert is the best X-Men artist. He's very good. I can't dig on the guy. Um, nothing but respect for his brother, him, his dad, like Kubert family. Yeah. Jim Script Lee and Will Sportatio for me. Those are my guys. Oh, dude. I, you know, I'm never going to say an unkind word about uh, Jim Lee, but Script, you and I have uh, a wide berth of comic book uh, appreciation in terms of eras. Can you think of a more influential family in comic books than the Kuberts? No. <laughs> I'm actually. I Am I lost right now? I know I. Uh, no, I, I mean, no, no, <laughs> I really can't. The kind of, Ramitas don't even come close. No, even though they're even though they're big. I'd say still, still not Kubert level. Well, I'd say because there are three Kuberts that all went on to be really impactful, I'll give them. Like in terms of like impact, but like none of the three guys though had the same impact on any characters that John Romita had on one, like alone. Because yeah. you know, the, the Joe Kubert stuff is like a lot of DC books or Hawkman or things that are awesome or Tarzan, but they're not Spider Man. And then when you got like the Andy and Adam work, you're always they're always like at the top of the list, but they don't really define a generation like other people do, like Ramita himself did. So that's why I always go with that, right? People are like, who are these yeah. people? Because like, These are comic I mean, book artists. Andy, Andy Kubert was, really was the penciler at, for this book right here. Yeah. Like, well, like Neil and Adams is really good for certain models, like on Batman, Green Arrow, and, and Superman. And that worked, but the thing is that 
like it didn't go any much further than that really like other people kind of threw on their own style after he stopped doing that regularly like yeah, Jim Apparel. Yeah. Yeah, it's really uh it's really hard to say. I I the other part too is like we've also had since then we've had kind of a few gaps in like te- like father sons or even siblings or what have you entering the comic world and actually putting a big stamp on there. Yeah, on not many heart. have. Yeah. Like and I'm just wondering will there be another Romita, you know, coming in and, and <laughs> to uh you know, continue that legacy. And I'm not, I don't think that's going to be the case. I think John Jr.'s it, right? Pretty much. Yeah, because he's, John Rita Sr.'s in his 60s at this point, I think, or close to 60. He's like around my mom's age. And Junior? And yeah, Junior, because Senior sadly, well, yeah, he, I'll we say lost, Senior sadly passed him away. Last year. Yeah. yeah, dude lived to be like 95 years old, though. When you it's reach not that like point he died life, young. <laughs> yeah, like it's like you lived a great life, you contributed to society, you're well remembered. Like the day he died, I went to a theme park and there was a little kid wearing a Spider Man shirt with a drawing. I was like, well, there you go. Literally on the day you die, it's like there's something, it lives on forever. But uh, I just was curious about that because when it comes to these guys, not enough people talk about the artists. Everyone can tell you Stan Lee, everyone can tell you. Uh, Neil Gaiman Neil or Gaiman, some Jack of these Kirby. other guys. Yeah, yeah. You know, J- oh, shit. Ramita Junior. Sixty seven. Thank you for googling that clone geek. Um, and yeah, Ramita Junior. Has been involved in many classic runs. I personally yeah. like him. He's my one of my favorite storytellers, and he's got a great run on X Men. I mean, shit. Mm-hmm. I think Kubert and Ramita Junior. were both working X Men books roughly in the same era. So, you know, you can't really go wrong with a lot of Marvel artists. That's the funny thing. For as much as people complain about like woke modern Marvel and some of these crappy books, which I'm here to fight, it sucks that a lot of really good artists get stuck drawing people standing in hallways and talking and all of this shit because it's like, hey, it's a waste this of is talents. Yeah, like you, you gotta you gotta give them something better to draw, something more fun to draw. Uh, you know, it just it, it's got to be something unique and exciting. And uh, Clone Geek. I agree. I wish it was as good as it used to be, but it all depends on who his inker is. If you get one of his good inkers, I think it was Scott Hanna inked him, then you'll get some more Ramita quality work that you realize. Because like his pencils for like 30 years have been really whatever. But if you get the right inker on Ramita Jr., you get a lot of work out of him. So mm-hmm. I have studied this shit way more than I should. Well, no, I'm a comic artist, so I need to know these things. Um, But I could... Honestly, we're going to do some comic book streams. You know, Wokebusters, folks, is almost here. I'm done. I'm just waiting on a couple things to be finished. Don't want to launch too early because I want to be able to have the right trailer and everything. But uh, I will be showing you guys more of my... I don't want to say comic book knowledge because I'm not trying to, like, geek out and say, oh, I know this. But to sell you guys books and to talk about these things on the level that I do, I have to be knowledgeable. And it's fun to talk about this stuff. If we didn't have the breaking news, believe me, I could sit and talk about rush strokes from joe sinnott for an hour and you'd be like who the fuck is that guy i'll go look at some fantastic four work then you'll see oh like it's a process and it's all fascinating so um oh the busema brothers yeah i forgot i consider fucking mm, yeah. john busema my favorite <laughs> so uh, him and ramita are like it's like really they're closely tied i like them for different things but uh yeah sal busema was good too man uh sal was the shit i don't want to He's still alive. That guy's like in his 90s, and I'm pretty sure he still draws. So, you know. Man's up there. <laughs> well, and for anyone who wants to know, did he draw anything important? He worked on many books for many decades, but he also worked on Maximum Carnage. So if you remember the video game Maximum Carnage, he worked on the comic book issues. Some of them, not all, but some of the issues that he drew were adapted into the game. So uh, look him up. He was working alongside... Uh, McFarlane at one point on Spectacular Spider-Man while McFarlane was on Amazing. Uh, You know, it's one of those names that should not go unknown. So now... um, We've got some breaking news. Yeah, into the the frying pan here. Oh, boy. Please take it away, sir. Well, go ahead, and if you can share on your screen what was posted by Mark Kern, uh, known as Grums on Twitter. That's the top link that I sent you. Yes, just a second right here. And here we are. Oh, wait, where'd it go? Crap, there it is. Right here. Right there. SBI Consulting Company. Here we go. All right. So I'm looking at the same uh, same thing on my screen. 
what this is, folks, is that SBI is referring to Sweet Baby Inc., uh, Sweet Baby Inc. style consulting company. Black Girl Gamers is threatening legal action over thatparkplace.com, uh, which you've seen articles that I have done over there on that park place. And uh, John Trent, of course, is the editor in chief. Jonas and Vash do the uh, YouTube channel. Apparently, uh, while we were beginning the show here, and that's why I went silent for a little bit, was because I had quite a bit of a flurry of activity behind the scenes with uh, coworkers and uh, management reaching out to figure out uh, what exactly this is. But apparently, and uh, this is what they have posted, Mark Kern is sharing what they've posted. Uh, they are threatening legal action against that park place for, quote, def uh, defamatory allegations, unquote. And they go on to say that they will pursue legal action against anyone who shares links to that park place's article or spreads it in any manner. Uh, it goes on to say, if you go down to the next uh, post by Grums, it says, claims they were falsely claimed to have been uh, employing discriminatory hiring practices by thatparkplace.com. Um, now, John Trent is the author of the article, and he put in there that it seems that they, and other uh, sentences that would, I think, defend against any sort of uh, definitive statement accusations, but not only that, if we go down uh, to the post where, let's see, where's this at? Uh, bu -bu 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 -bu. If we go down to where Grums says BGG's own website, if you can find that one, it's in the same thread. It's uh, Grums, who is Mark Kern, who's the former project lead of World of Warcraft, says Black Girl Gaming's own website claims to be 100% minority operated. He says, I've seen minority owned, but what does minority operated mean? It is unclear if they mean 100% of management or 100% of all staff. Uh, the 100% minority operated claim, the sealed job board, and the lack of a hiring policy on the website seem to contradict their claims of their hiring practices being readily available and easily searchable. Essentially, although I can't say much because you all know that any attorney would say not to say much in this sort of a situation, but I'll speak in very objective uh, third-person way here. Uh, there appears to be an article on that park place that uh, cites a number of things, including statements from uh, people who work for that or for a black girl gaming. And as a result of that being put online, they are threatening to sue the website and they are threatening to sue anyone who links to the website and I would just say that, uh, you know, I've looked at the article and, you know, it's a very normal article. It's very, uh, it's just, it's just telling news. It's, it quotes uh, them in what they say. In fact, I will read uh, what they apparently are taking umbrage with. And typically, also, I would say that when someone takes issue with uh, journalism, they would ask for a retraction before they would they they would attempt to uh uh file a lawsuit um but here's here's the quote that they apparently do not like it's here's what it says on that part place it says back on february 19th the organization that is black girl gamers appeared to post a job art opportunity on x limiting the applicants based on race and gender the organization wrote looking for black women content creators that make dungeons and dragons D, &D content for some potential brand work hit us up. And it has the screen cap of them uh, posting that. And so that is that is what is posted. That's the entirety of the, the claim that I think they must not like. And, uh, you know, you cannot definitively say why a group would threaten to take legal action, but uh, that's what we've got going on right now. And uh, I'll be in communications with John Trent to, because uh, I think they're also threatening to sue him individually. So very interesting evening. You just never know what's going to happen when you attempt to cover the news objectively. No, I mean, when I had seen the link or whatever, I was like, oh, wow. Okay. So I didn't want to say anything about it because I'm not involved in any of this, but uh, yeah, this, I'll just have to be following this because 
it's all news to me. I don't want I'm not trying to not be involved with any of this. I just, it's all news and that's not what I'm trying to so, go. So to give you some idea, so you're aware of the sweet baby ink stuff, right? Yes. Yes. Okay. So this is one of those same kinds of companies. They come in. Oh, okay. And their job is to, in my estimation, okay, this is, this is pros opinion and I'm allowed to have one in the United States. Um, their job is to come in and propagandize video game in, you know, content. And so in in just a mundane article that's covering these sorts of things that Park Place is covering, that they appear to have discriminatory hiring practices based on a post they put on X. And it puts the post from X on the article. And that's apparently enough for them to uh, want to file lawsuits and take legal action. So very interesting well, tactic. I, I, you know, I'll leave it there, but I, I'm happy to answer any questions that I can. I just, uh, I am I am savvy enough to go ahead and pretend to understand what attorneys would say to, to respond to in this kind of a situation, but I'll be happy to answer any questions you have. Well, that's the reason. I, I don't want to say anything to cause you any problems, so that's why I'm just going to defer to you, so I don't want to infer or add anything to this that might cause you any future problems so uh, <laughs> well, I, you know i just i'm just trying to tell you is, why i'm taking the approach i am because i don't want to say something yeah 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 be like Th used against you or something so this one is so i mean, I mean you're, you're free to pull up the, that park place article if you want to now i don't know they might, <laughs> they might try to sue you who knows what would happen but uh you know it's it's not an article that is what would i say here the article literally posts the screenshot of them only seeking help from black women, uh, I you know, and the the company itself declares that it is entirely one hundred percent minority operated, not not minority owned, but minority operated. How can you be entirely minority operated unless you're discriminatory? Because the moment that you accidentally hired someone of non minority status, you can no longer be minority operated because. Any individual who works at your company is in some capacity an operator of something. So that that doesn't work. <laughs> so this is that's why I'm so uh, uh, why I'm so uh, befuddled by this strategy unless they have uh, a, a different goal in mind by uh, making this kind of a statement than what they uh, are saying forthrightly. How's that? Am I am I dancing well enough with the with the uh, Careful verbiage, guys. I think I'm doing an okay job on that. Yeah, I think you're hopscotching around it fairly well. Yeah, we'll hopscotch it. Ripaverse has done these kinds of things before where you see somebody take uh, some action that you're like, oh, come on. We won't uh, go into details, but, you know. I don't even know what you're talking about. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Water under the bridge. But these are the kinds of things that happen. But, you know, uh, as journalists, you have to tell the truth. And I can't look at this article and figure out any way around. I mean, if there was something in there that... Uh, that was out of bounds. I'd be in in contact with John and saying, "John, we got to get this fixed. This is not, uh, you know, this is a step too far or something." But I mean, my gosh, it's 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 right there in the article. So mm -hmm. if you uh, if when someone makes a threat like that, and and you in all all honesty believe that your journalism and your reporting is accurate, and if others look at it and say, "Well, yes, it's accurate." You can't pull that kind of stuff down under threat or else you would have to take everything down because every company within threat and every journalist who said something they didn't like. And that's why there are such strong protections under the Constitution to defend, right? We have the freedom of press to report on things in good faith. So uh, you know, we'll see how this plays out. But that was the breaking news that drew me away from being fully engaged in the conversation prior. <clears throat> Believe me, no explanation needed at all. So, um, just another day in the frying pan. Don't you just love how <laughs> crazy life on the internet really is? Like, just across the board, the stuff that you interact and encounter all the time. I mean, people I'm never who are perpetually online are unhealthy people. Well, I'll tell you, I'll tell you this. So, there was a time when we had an individual out there who was attempting to dox me. And that individual doxed someone else, some a, a random individual who had no idea that they were being doxed. 
so we were talking to a, to uh, our our legal team about you know what do you what do we do? We don't want this person out there to be damaged, you know, unknowingly, unwittingly, you know, having their identity attached, and they have no idea. And uh, one of the things that the uh, a legal rep said to us was, "This is the path. This is the lot you all have chosen. <laughs> you live in the mm-hmm. world of zanies and crazies now." And uh, so. <laughs> They it just is that told, told it to you straight. <laughs> That's right. Exactly. <laughs> it's sad well, that it has to be good advertisement that for that park place in the channel. So, I mean, there's that. Yeah. I, I have a feeling that that will also be part of uh, what happens here. So, uh, we'll we'll ride the ship and see what happens. But, yes, I think, I think a secondary or perhaps primary result of this will be more uh, focus on that park place from people who had never heard of it before. Mm-hmm. Well, that's good. Yeah. You guys want to write some articles now? Let's get at it. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, I don't know if you could afford me. Jeff's got breaking news on the Acolyte uh, toys already being (laughs) on uh, discount. I mean, this is, this, it's got to go to the presses. Yeah. What breaking news? Wokebusters is out. There you go. There's some, there's an article. Uh, No, but um, Acolyte toys, I can't wait to make that toy video because folks, we count down the days now till when it will appear in an Ollie's. So when we watch the Acolyte video, tell me in the comments section just how long it's going to take to get there. Uh, my guess is, honest guess, never because they'll underproduce these toys. Fun guess, eh, under a year. But you never know what shows up. They get exclusives. They get limited runs. They get things that are only made for certain retailers all at Ollie's. So... You know, we'll have some fun with that and uh, be on the lookout. I'm going to be doing some traveling in about two weeks. I'm going to another region of the country. And guess what? They have Ollie's in this part of the country. So, of course, when are you I've coming to Dallas? Dallas? Uh, when do you want me to show up in Dallas? When does Dallas need me? Uh, I don't know. Freaking come to Fan Expo in June. That is possible. It that gives you possible. a few months. Yeah, it just uh I gotta see where I am with my uh with my book and the promotion and the fulfillment and all that stuff. So fair you know, enough. Fair enough. But I can always sneak away for two days. I have a fulfillment team, so that's exciting. But yeah, uh, yeah. yeah, I got it, you I know, we got a lot going on. Shit. Yeah, I got a lot of a lot of people behind the stuff now. I just don't promote it as much because it's not like a lot of people make the book, it's just like a lot of people are there to like help me get the shit done so we can be on the same scale as other places so mm-hmm. yeah there you go there's my unofficial official announcement folks uh, you know we're a force to be reckoned with the woke busters is you know gonna be here soon we'll talk about it then uh, i don't really want i am i am woke bust i'm not woke bustered out but man i gave that pitch probably i don't want to say 500 that's an exorbitant amount like 200 times so i am not going to talk about it right now don't I don't, I don't confirm <laughs> or deny but I'm just hoping that there's some sort of don't cross the streams joke in that book. I don't need a confirmation or a denial. It's I'm funny putting because that out into the let, me just, let me respond with a comment. I have had people ask that question a lot over the weekend. You know, the, the one question I'll address is somebody goes, is this making fun of Ghostbusters? No, I love Ghostbusters. This is like to honor it to the nth degree. It's like mm-hmm. we don't really make fun of it. We make fun of society with it. Mm-hmm. So don't get any mistakes. Like if you love Ghostbusters, this is this might be the best book, Ghostbusters comic you've never officially read. So who knows? But um, I digress. Moving on. Um the the joke that you're asking about is referenced by a lot of people. Will it be in the book? Find out in a few weeks. Uh, <laughs> remember, I wrote this comic uh, as a as an homage to certain things, so maybe it's in there. Who knows? There are all kinds of cool things. I'll tell you, there's two diehard references that I hope people get because it was <laughs> like, but I really like Die Hard, and I'm like, wait, this would make sense organically in the story. How can I throw this little like this story is written? This would work. So, you know, it's not a pop culture reference to the comic book. You'll never know unless you've seen the movie. But, you know, it's just, it's there's a lot of me in there, too. So if you like a celebration of pop culture, and, and you want to, here's the thing, too, folks. It's got a lot to say in it in the best way possible through comedy. So just be on the lookout. I will give you plenty of opportunities to get it and a whole lot more. I will be Andrew, a customer. 
Oh, Andrew, I have six foot tall displays of Wokebusters now. <laughs> oh my gosh! <laughs> I, I I took it. Uh, I took it to the uh, to the convention. I have like the one of us in front of the Ghostbusters 2016 rubble, and the one that's like us coming out of like the poster. And then I had. I did the painting like Ghostbusters 2 with the baby, you know, at the very end. I got yeah. that back, uh, and I had a full size one of those on uh, on rep on show as well. And then a new poster I made, so people just were like, "What is this?" And then they kept coming over. So, oh, folks, I can't wait. I got to make this trailer. It's taking scripts advice. I'm going to get that one eight hundred number through Google or whatever the Google number is. I've already kind That's of written so those cool. commercials. That's um, awesome. Yeah, there's. Fuck the song. The song is in production too. I got somebody writing me music. So if Ghostbusters had it, so does Wokebusters, including who can you call? Like you can call that number from Ghostbusters back in the day. You can call Wokebusters. You might get a response. You might get an answer. You might get a recording. They might show up in your house and help you. So just, you know, <laughs> make sure you call them. That's so freaking awesome. Well, here's the thing. If you're going to do this shit, do it right. And I just mean like every level. Like, if it's worth doing, it's worth overdoing. Yeah, it's like fuck, man. I initiative clean up Portland. I got URLs. You'll be able to find some domains in the book and check them out and see what's up to expand the universe of Wokebusters. And I'll probably update those websites fairly, you know, once every once in a while, so you can keep making your book up to date and fun. You know, just shit. I don't think anyone else is doing this stuff, so why not? I haven't seen that on anybody else. No. Yeah, it's uh, that's fun. Yeah. I was reading the chat right now. I know it's not a Christmas comic, but my next one might be. Be on the lookout for that around Christmas. Who knows? Maybe so, that's their not so subtle hint at saying that you should do a Die Hard spinoff or spoof now. Die Soft or Live Soft instead of Die Hard. <laughs> well, Live Soft, the... and it's some twink. <laughs> well, here's Timothy the thing: Salome, stuck in a building, <laughs> and he has to save his family during Christmas during Hanukkah. There we go. And uh, yeah. Oh. He's no, he's locked in the booth of an ATM and he can't get out the front door. That's just two hours of him, like, you know, struggling to get out, crying and shit. Uh, you know, Die Hard could be a fun thing to parody, but then again, Die Hard's kind of been parodied through movies like Speed or Under Siege or Under Siege 2, or was it Sudden Impact, the Van Damme movie that takes place at the Penguins game? Like, you know, I will do more parody stuff down the road, but. We got to take a break to get to some other cool stuff. People want characters. People want heroes. I want that stuff, too. You know, mm -hmm. we're creating a comic book business as well. I'm just going to draw it all. So it'll be a lot of Hell fun. Yeah. Looks like we also need to let uh, our special guest get to some business here. Yes, unfortunately, uh, I am I am needed to uh, take some phone calls. But I do appreciate the opportunity to be on. I apologize for not being more engaged. Oh, you got uh, stuff to take care of, man. Do not apologize. Did okay. not Everyone here uh, understands. Be juggling. Yep. So mm -hmm. you're always welcome back. Probably. I will owe you. I will owe you a rain check when I can be more fully engaged and uh, all of that. So happy to come Look, back. It's on just too. an excuse to have more fun. So we'll talk to you. That's right. you take care of stuff and uh, you know keep us up to date, man, with everything. More fun on the way, folks. And I will be staying tuned. You do too. To world class BSers, script doctor. Can't wait to hear your thoughts as well. Later, guys. Thanks. See you, sir. Okay, this setup is wrong. There we go. I was about to say, wow. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I'm well, just I'm, like, I'm uh, a little what? closer to Jeff than I need to be here. Yeah, buddy. No, we'll keep I it at know. arm's length. We're cool. Arm's length, or like cheersing length is cool. <laughs> uh, to our <laughs> listeners over on Rumble, um, you eventually can buy toys by weight at Ollie's. If toys do not sell after a certain point, they will clearance them out and sell them by weight. I had talked to an Ollie's employee and got this directly from them. So maybe in the future, we'll have Shuri Copters by weight. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. If anybody no, actually Clone wants Geek, that. This is an amazing idea. I'll just write this one down since you're like, do this idea. Well, the lost we Kenner Star Wars action figures and since That's amazing. I mean... If anything, that would make an amazing WCBS skit where the guys are in town for a convention <laughs> yeah. learn about the lost Ken or whatever. We go on this Goonies esque quest over the course of like, because the Goonies takes place over a day. Like it's a Saturday yeah. afternoon mm -hmm. into Sunday morning. So, like, our convention shit, we can be at a convention. We go off on this adventure Saturday afternoon. We get at, we get back Sunday morning. It ends at the convention and we return with that rare, 
you know, rocket firing both out with the J slot or some shit. I don't know. Actually, I do know. I know way more than I should. <laughs> it's weird the shit I I I have remembered from childhood. It's like I would go and study this in a library, like it was a real thing to study. <laughs> Uh, of course, Retro Blaston will cameo in it. He could be the guy that has the rare Star Wars action figure in Cincinnati. He could play the former Kenner employee. Um, I gotta get Bobby yeah, from Valiverse as well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I, I've told you guys that we have a Kenner display here. It's a mural in downtown Cincinnati of all the old toys painted. Um, it's beautiful. It's like a really cool piece of art. Uh, maybe I'll do a... Uh, I'll do a video standing in front of it one day. There you go, folks, because it's down uh, by somewhere I frequent downtown. So maybe I'll go down, or not maybe, I will go down there and film myself talking in front of it. There you go. We'll do a little video. So um, let's see. Is there anything else we got to cover before we check in with the audience? Anything you want to cover? Or should we check in with the audience and uh, kind of take it from there? I said, let's see what the audience has got going on. I think we All covered right. Acolyte, we covered X-Men, we covered uh um I mean we didn't we didn't talk much about Ghostbusters, but there isn't it doesn't seem like there's that much to say. Audiences seem to be fairly split. Or at least I should say people online seem to be fairly split. Um the movie is performing decently, like it made forty four million. Yeah, like mm -hmm. it made almost fifty million in its opening weekend. That's nothing to sneeze at. Uh, it based on the level of CGI that it looks like was put into it, it probably needs a good deal more than that. But it doesn't have a lot of CGI. Oh, no, really? It's all, it's all so uh, back end. The loaded. trailer looked like it was a lot. But Andrew, the trailer is the entire, all the action scenes from the entire movie. There's nothing else. Like everything that you saw in the trailer, it's like the the shit at the Coney Island. That's the end of the movie. It was yeah. presented that this movie was going to be the Ghostbusters in an ice landscape fighting ghosts. That never happens. This movie climax is the last five minutes. It's seen in the trailer, and the actual fight takes place in the mechanics bay of the Ghostbusters firehouse. Nothing is really dangerous, and anytime someone's frozen, they're instantly like unthawed or thought out, excuse me. So there's not really this like sense of danger or stakes. Mm. It just kind of is underwhelming. And then it ends and you go, Oh, I like, it's not a bad film. The actors are fine. The kids are fine actors. Like it's all, I mean, the kids were fine in afterlife. Yeah. They're all equally good. Like there's nothing to really shit on them. There's really nothing to shit on people. You know, somebody said like, at the convention I was at because it had just come out and it was a horror show, so people were all going to see it. They were talking about the lesbian coding between Phoebe and the ghost, and I was like, I guess there was like that, but maybe I didn't really read it as that. So maybe a situation where people were trying to find more about it. But there are people it, that try and read that well, into literally they're, everything. They're they're shrieking at at ghosts that are there because there's no Hollywood today has no coding for things like lesbianism. They either do it or they don't. Like yeah. there's, there's no reason for them to code around it because they don't care. And the other part too, is there's not really any romantic chemistry between Paul Rudd's character and the mom. So when, if you don't see a romantic chemistry, but you do see two women that are friends, you kind of, you know, sort of write in the blanks there so that you actually see it. Because one thing that we've been lacking in a lot of the bigger movies is romance, romance, the, the romance subplot. We don't have them. There's, almost non-existent and especially on the Disney side of things, unless they're geared specifically towards a certain demographic. I mean, like it's just, it's not there. And in the Sony stuff, it's like, I didn't feel any chemistry between Paul Rudd and, and uh, Phoebe's mom. Mm -hmm. um, there was more grandpa to granddaughter chemistry between Ray and Phoebe in, in that movie. And I, I, I thought that was actually pretty, pretty decent. Uh, I will say it's biggest flaw is that it breaks the set, the seven character rule, which is, if you're going to have a large cast, cap it off at seven. If you go beyond that, you're you're overburdening the the story. There's too many people to maintain and understand. This one had almost fourteen, I think, because uh, you, yeah. you had the you had the you had Janine and the original and the remaining three Ghostbusters. Then you had the four new characters. That's your eight right there. Then you had Lucky. Then you had the the blonde scientist guy. Then you had Kamal Nanjani, and then you had William Atherton, and then you had the villain. So you're just kind of going crazy, Wait, Scott. Yeah, there's a <laughs> yeah. lot of people in there. That's so many and, characters. And this one, this movie 
is more aping the formula of Ghostbusters Afterlife, especially because I didn't even bring up the ghost, the, les the, the supposed lesbian one, Melody. There you go. There's another character. Melody is basically a, a new version of what Egon was in Afterlife and serves the exact same function. It, so they're, they're, parody, they're kind of parroting off Afterlife formula as opposed to going back to the traditional Ghostbusters formula, which is there's a problem. They present a mystery. They see an escalation in ghost activity. That is actually leading to a essentially a purge uh, or, or an, an ultimate catharsis of PKE energy that the main bad guy is going to use to try and take over the world. And they almost got it with Frozen Empire. But it, it, it's so delayed gratification and, and the mystery and the aspect and the entertainment. And also, here's the other part, too. This is why I, I found that Afterlife is a movie set in the Ghostbusters universe and not a Ghostbusters movie because an essential part of Ghostbusters, especially the original two, two films, is you have the montage. The montage of when things are kind of picking up for them. Business is good. You do that business is good montage, that tells you, okay, we're, we're jumping over some time. They're, they're back in the swing of things or they're getting in the swing of things if it's one or two. And now we get the next big story beat, which is, okay, we've captured all these ghosts. This is what we realize. Oh, man, the containment grid is getting really crowded. Oh, the slime that we're finding slime all over the city that's kind of growing and showing up in places it shouldn't be. This is the central problem. We didn't get that with Frozen Empire. No, we didn't. No. And I saw your review. And to your point, the, the whole firehouse aspect, they stepped on the joke, which was uh, Venkman and Egon trying to lowball the realtor to get a better price on the location that they liked. And Ray ruins that because yeah. he's so happy about it. And then we see another version of that later when Egon and P and Peter are trying to are billing the hotel manager, and Egon's flashing up the fingers for the price four thousand five thousand one extra thousand dollars five thousand dollars total. We see that relationship, and I think there's a deleted scene where they were doing it again somewhere else, and I can't remember where it was, but they cut it. But that was what that was the gag is that these Ray is the hopeful, excited guy, Bankman is the is the salesperson and Egon is the, the engineer, so to speak. And Egon's like, this is what it costs. Bankman's like, all right, this is how I pitch it to sell. And then Ray is like, and now I'm the advertising. This is exciting. This is great. We can do all this. I can tell you all the details of what's going on with the ghosts and the vapors and all that stuff. You kind of have to, you have to find a new dynamic of that with this next generation. Uh, get rid of Finn, get rid of lucky. Sa sadly, you got to get rid of podcast. Uh, Phoebe's fine. Put the mom on the telephones because she actually would serve a function there. Uh, and maybe bring in one actual youthful adult ghost, ghostbuster that's under the age of 40 or 50 because Paul Rudd's 56. Uh, and uh, <laughs> and just kind of carried on that way with the traditional ghostbusters basically being like management and mentors. Like they're not going to be in the field, but they they can answer questions. They can do all the gear tech stuff. They can, you know, guide these uh, these kids through the new generation, teach them about Tobin Spirit Guides or Space Catalog or any of that other stuff, and you know, have some fun with it. I I missed the. There's like a feeling that you get watching some of these movies, and Afterlife captured some of that in specific scenes, and this one captured it when they played the Ghostbusters theme and the movie ended. I felt like a lot of this was just <clears throat> Ghostbusters imagery waiting to be introduced through a very thin story it's like hey yeah. check out all this cool science stuff and hey, we're gonna tease you that these ghosts are gonna escape but they don't and they just like it's like we keep getting tossed cool things that could happen but never do and i i think it was uh you script that had brought up the budget of this film being fairly low i see that like i'm not saying this movie looks bad none of the it effects are bad spent every dollar, dollar properly yeah but it just you can tell it's like oh um you couldn't go for a big, bigger spectacle. But the thing is, you don't necessarily need that. But one, it's Ghostbusters, and even though you know maybe people don't like Ghostbusters too as much, you know the the Statue of Liberty. Yeah, maybe two is kind of undrawn because they're in that fucking museum. Never mind. Number two, I was gonna say, number two has a charm to it in the fact that it's old hat for them, so we're getting to see them more work as a team as opposed to figuring it out. Like that's, that's a different dynamic. And there's something funny there. Like the whole, the toaster scene is great. That's Ghostbusters being the, the partners, the family, the, the, like, this is what we like to do type of stuff. And then it gets into the third act where it's like, now we're repeating the beats of the first movie. 
You know, we're having the big downtown giant golem walking the streets, uh, but we're going to throw a little bit of a twist on it. With with Frozen Empire, one of the things that it did that I think hurt the integrity of what the Ghostbusters franchise would be is giving a human being a supernatural effect. And that's because the, yeah. it's, about, it's about science versus the supernatural. That is the one of the many undertones that's going on through this. And the fact that they brought in supernatural for really no reason. And in a sense, it just didn't work for me. I'm like, okay, you have a firebender. Um, that's not Ghostbusters. Ghostbusters wouldn't care about that. It would be better if he was the guy that wanted this ice creature released. If he was like a Janos, but instead of being possessed, he was literally just trying to do it because he has his own agenda, his own obsession or something of that nature. That is more Ghostbusters. That's what like Harold Ramis would throw in there. He's like, no, no, don't make him a firebender. Make him the guy who's like, listen, I don't know how, I don't have a trans, I don't know how to open this, this, uh, orb. But if I sell it to the Ghostbusters, they'll find out how to open it. And then I will steal that with method and use it myself to open this orb. That is a total Harold Ramis working with Dan Aykroyd, getting a plot streamlined in type of angle. And also on top of that, you get to do something that Hollywood hasn't done in a while. And that is you make a person of non a Caucasian ethnicity, a bad guy. Yeah. Uh, Camille on Johnny's character was just so dumb. Like I know we were all concerned about Patton Oswalt, but he was in it for you know a blink and you miss it kind of moment. Yeah. In this with Camille Nanjani, though, I never took it into account the way you described the science versus uh the supernatural, but it just it didn't really feel like interesting or necessary, or it just felt like you're trying to have another Vince Clortho. Like yeah. you know, when he was possessed and all this shit. It just that's where I am with all these legacy sequels. It's they're trying to figure out how to make the same movie over and over again without the parts that the movie needs. It's just like, hey, we want we want Ghostbusters in the car. We want Ghostbusters doing this. We want Ghostbusters doing that. And we don't care what we do in the in-between. Because they think that people are stupid enough and also to their soul, they're able to sell a product in that package like Frozen Empire looks like this huge, great movie, folks. And you're going to watch it and go, this is oddly small. This has very little going on. Like, that's fine if, you know, you want it's that. It's an old movie, movie. movie. Yeah. And then, you know, that's what these movies are. It's like with the Star Wars movies. They just had a lot more money to just give you iconic imagery and the actors and this and that. None of them ever have a justification to exist. I, I thought Afterlife did because it needed to fix fix ghostbusters because god that 2016 one was shitty and did cause problems for a brand and then you get to uh afterlife and everything is great and i'm happy and the ending's fun and you go eh, it does borrow a lot from the ending hit the feels too a little bit there that's yeah. what that movie had and you go into this one and you don't have any of that and so i go eh, ghostbusters has peaked i liked the last one i'm on board with these kids taking over if they do stuff Mm -hmm. You know, script. I thought it was really stupid the scene where they get the call and they go to the diner and they blow out the window and just run off, and there's like no ramifications about more property damage. Or, like, I yeah. thought that was going to be addressed. I thought, like, because my big complaint, and I'll say it for those who didn't watch the, re the review the villain, like the bad guys, aka New York City, like they were way more justified than they were in the original Ghostbusters because it was a situation of we're not really causing problems, it's hypothetical. You know, like, oh, this could leak. This could do that. And it's not until Walter Peck turns off the ghost trap that shit escapes and there's a bigger problem. But in this one, like, the Ghostbusters destroy property. They, they're they fighting a ghost that's from a sewer. They destroy other shit. They're, like, letting a kid work under the table illegally. And so the things that the Ghostbusters are getting dinged for, I go, yeah, I guess. And, you know, in the real world, I would not really be pro-Ghostbusters either right now. And so I thought, why would, why would you? Yeah. Yeah, why would you write that in a story, though? If you're trying to sell me on the Ghostbusters returning and I should be excited, like, why are they kind of the assholes? I think that's just because they didn't... This this round here, because this one was more written by um, uh, the director than it was Jason Reitman. Because Jason Reitman was co-writer and primarily the producer. He switched roles with... Um, 
Gil, whatever his name is, Gil Alden or something it was. Because he, he was right? Gil Kanan, yeah, because he was the producer and co-writer of Afterlife. They switched their roles for this one as part of the, the terms. And Ivan Reitman started the production of it before he passed away, um, sadly. And I, I just think that he didn't quite capture it enough, but he caught enough of it to basically allow for no one else to say push back. Like, oh, we're kind of missing something. Like, th there's a number of things that are thrown off on this. For, st for starters, I don't believe Ray Stance would do a Antiques Roadshow style podcast of that thing, but Peter Bankman would. Yeah. Ray wouldn't um, destroy the objects either. No. And I love, I mean, I like the joke that the watch keeps beeping. It's like, okay, it's, it's an alarm. <laughs> it's not a possessed thing. I get the joke there, but it doesn't have the sophisticated level like Egon when he's conducting emotional experiments on a couple seeking marriage counseling and he's increasing the temperature of the room and asking them to constantly wait hours and hours, essentially going to ruin this couple's relationship and then charting the, the reactions for whatever, or Peter Vankman using negative reinforcement and how it affects ESP. Like these are charlatan gimmick experiments. That's making fun of the concept of, of basically institutionalized university science sciences that are being funded for no reason other than to support these scientists that have no actual theories of, uh, or any useful information. And the joke is once they're kicked out of uh, the school and have to go in the private sector, they actually have to do something of use in order to survive. <laughs> they, they completely uh, miss that. And, and the other part, too, is like there's no real sense of irony. I love the fact that in the first 10 minutes of the movie, you get um, the character of Milton, who's played by uh, Je Jeffrey Dunn. I no, not Jeff Dunn. Um, something Dunn, who says, I believe the end of the world will be happen at the stroke of midnight of this year. And it's like that's the end of the movie. Like that is what he's actually 100 percent right. And the joke is that nobody believes him. And they don't. And the better part of the joke is that not even Peter or anyone else acknowledges the fact that that dude was right <laughs> when the movie happened in the movie happens that is part of the joke you don't get those levels of sophistication in in these movies because sadly like as you know jason reitman was the very first ghostbusters fan because he was there the day it was made and came up with and everything he was the first no one can argue that he wasn't the first um but now that he's you know 50 odd years old and he's he's doing this stuff not just because he loves it but also to honor his father and, and the friendships he has with the people that did the first film uh, I think he needs to get another person in there of a higher pe pedigree if he wants this franchise to go the distance. And even though Sony wants to make it its own Marvel cinematic universe of sorts, it's not going to be there if they're not going to stay, get away from the family aspect and go back into the blue collar versus bureaucracy aspect of what this means. It's like the, the next natural progression would be, hey, we're expanding Ghostbusters into another state and we got to deal with that state's bureaucracy now trying to, you know, solve these ghost problems uh, or more, more, uh, more interestingly, one that I pitched back in 08, which is uh, other companies are now doing their own ghost prevention technology that might actually damage the Ghostbusters being able to be competitive in this industry. Or what happens if ghosts are so frequent that they're treated like cockroaches and rats? Some people will hire an exterminator. Other people just let it go uh, and don't care because of the expenses. And I, and I remember that in Brooklyn when I stayed there for a few months where there's a big rat problem. And it's like, we should get an exterminator. It's like, nah, they'll have to tent the whole building. We just don't want to spend the money or we'll have to relocate for three weeks. So we'll just, you know, we'll just clean everything and make sure we, I'm like, I am not staying here. <laughs> but that was, that's the joke. And that's something you could explore with Ghostbusters that unfortunately they don't have anyone at Ghost Corps uh, who, if they have those ideas, they're not being taken uh, in in a serious enough tone for an earnest comedy like Ghostbusters to further further use. I I didn't really see anything left for Ghostbusters. I mean, the idea that you just came up with of you know other states is interesting, but it would be interesting if it was the Ghostbusters. I I can't stop mm -hmm. saying this. We you know Andrew mentioned people care about the characters. The characters from Ghostbusters are just the actors. Like they're played by a specific group of people. It's not one of these James Bond situations. And right. the Ghostbusters really isn't a roster of ever-changing heroes. Because, let's be honest, again, it's the movie and that cartoon that are the things that people love. And then Ghostbusters 2 is a byproduct of trying to cash in on that cartoon and create uh, something in that vein. 
but both also everything game they did that I heard was actually pretty solid. Oh, the 09 game is awesome. But yeah. that's the thing. It goes, it's awesome because it's a, a continuing adventures of Ray Egon, Venkman, and Winston. The, the only things we actually care about. They like, mm-hmm. this is for everything in Hollywood. People care about the characters from the stories, not the world of the fucking stories. It doesn't work that way because Ghostbusters just takes place in New York, where in New York, where there are ghosts. That's the only difference. Same World Series winners, same Super Bowl winners, same movies come out except Ghostbusters because it's not real. Other than that, that's it. But to try to sell me on this multiversal, or not multiverse thing, but like all these other characters, no. It really, to me personally, it works best when it's a small business run by four guys that are just like on the seat of their pants. I, yeah. I don't even know if I like I liked the laboratory, but I don't think it just didn't it, it felt like the natural progression, but it also felt like something like a fan film would come up with. Like, here's the Ghostbusters lab, and it's all these fun, kitschy things. And you're like, yeah, I guess that is. But I for me, the magic of Ghostbusters is they have specific technology, you know how it works, and like they add some stuff, but it's not like they keep adding on like it's a James Bond movie. Like Ghostbusters headquarters isn't like Q Lab to me. It's because they're they're so much blue collar as, as much as they are scientists. And I don't think people think about it that way. Like, what does Ray say when they get it? It's Miller time. Like they, he doesn't go, let's go back and investigate. No, like they go, they eat Chinese food, they got arcade machines in their house, like they're just people and i think we just when you try to expand a franchise past its point of no or past its you know expiration date you get frozen empire uh, a surprisingly okay film that really you know if i look for it, a surprisingly for me a surprisingly bad film that's made very well like it's not a bad film because it's made with glaring holes or it's offensive or it's anything like that i just can't see a reason for it existing so yeah i it, will just stand it there it almost didn't um it didn't fulfill the potential of the premise. That that's no. the other part too. Like I think the ghost lab is fine, but I would be more I would be more believable if it's like, yeah, we built a sub basement underneath the initial one. Because why would yeah. they want to drive out literally out of the five boroughs into Jersey, it looks like, to set up a ghost lab? <laughs> it's like, no, they would just expand it. They'd buy the building next door or something like that's what they would do. Because it's like, keep it all in one area so that they can actually monitor it and not have to worry about driving around uh, back and forth and all that stuff. And yeah, like it, it just, it's basically, they were playing more with the toys and the idea that they could have in the future as opposed to servicing. What does it mean when a company that has been shuttered for 20 years, 25 years comes back? Uh, comes back to restart the business. First of all, you got to renovate, then you got to do branding, then you got to do like, you know, advertising and stuff. Why aren't we seeing like uh, web abs, web, web-based advertisement bits or Twitter or X stuff of the Ghostbuster commercials that you would get in a montage of the new team coming in? Um, why why are we not seeing, um, gosh, I almost ha- I had a thought there, now I'm just kind of losing it. Uh, yeah, like it's, it, we're just not getting all, all the cool and interesting um interesting fun parts of what is what the story could be uh yeah um i had a thought and it just completely got, went right out of my head <laughs> i have that happen so many times on the year. Probably i think we can all say we've had that happen a number of times whether yeah. we're live or not i bet the I audience has thoughts, thoughts though Mm-hmm. Uh yeah, so let's see what Dirty D Senpai has. He says, "Hey fellas, yo WDW Pro, I heard a Disney board is having a proxy fight. Seems like the Pelts has a strong hand." Uh Dirty D Senpai, thank you for being a member of the channel for a month. Sorry we didn't get to this when Pro was here, but as you guys heard the news and um you know, he had to step away from that. But Dirty D Senpai, thank you very much for being a member of the channel. Appreciate and uh guys, are you following any of that proxy fight? Yeah, a little bit here. Yeah, a little bit. I'm I'm interested to see what happens. I don't ultimately think it's going to change anything, honestly, but I'd be here for it if it did. I yeah. I'm I'm up to see anybody like at least take a swing at Disney and Iger at this point. Like, all right, fine. Let's let's see what you got. Let, how many rounds can you go? <laughs> <coughs> Excuse me. John Thomas says, "Jeff, 
The child empress actress from The NeverEnding Story has a family fantasy film coming, Man and Witch, distributed by Fathom Events, Sean Astin and Christopher Lloyd. Oh, shit. Sure. Ah. Hmm. Um, well, yeah, you that? know, hold on, let me take a screenshot of that. That actually sounds like it could be kind of cool. I like to check out Fathom Events stuff because it's... Look, I always will sing the virtue of a movie theater. I get it. If you have a family and it's $100 to take your family out, oh, I understand yeah. that. But if you're like me... And you you know you have the income and you're single and you can do what you want in that regard. It's like I like movie theaters. I, you know, Ghostbusters may have not been my cup of tea, but it was nice to go out, see it with a couple people, eat some popcorn, and experience yeah. on a giant screen. Fathom Events gives me shit that I won't really see elsewhere, mm -hmm. and you know I'll pay more attention to something in a theater than I will streaming. I'll be honest with you. Yeah. I'm one of those people. I can put my phone away. For a four-hour movie, I don't need to be knowing what's on going on on social media. Like, I need mm -hmm. to do better about it because folks will notice, like, kind of don't appear on Saturdays and Sundays because I needed some time to reset away from social media. But I digress. My point is, if I'm at home and the movie's not every minute being, you know, catching my attention, I might check the time. I might check my phone. I might mm -hmm. forget I miss a scene here and there. So that's just, you know, what it is. But John... I now have a screenshot of that. I'm going to give that a check. Uh, I have my Regal Pass. so totally get that. I got to, uh, like, less than a week before I moved from Austin up to the Dallas area. Um, my local theater that I'd been attending for the last three and a half years had a one-night showing of the Final Fantasy VII sequel movie. Nice. And I was like, I, I didn't get to see this in theaters before i'm gonna go see this and so that that's a cool thing that's not something you would normally you know be able to see in a movie theater so i like when theaters do cool stuff like that i do too and even though i don't like to spend ten dollars for popcorn movie theater popcorn is still the best it is uh, there's there's no uh, comparison Adam Wofford, thank you very much. He says, Jeff, if you only knew someone that made a horror movie, short story of Dion reading the Necronomicon 37 times. Yeah, I could uh, I could call a guy. I know um, a few people who make horror movies. I know you know, I know some like people. dozens of people that make horror movies. <laughs> okay, can you get me close to? Oh no, Richard Donner's no longer with us. I was like, the Owen would be the right tone I want to make. Uh, we'll, we'll talk. I just want to do some cool horror comics. I don't feel like anybody in America is doing some cool ones right now, so that might be fun. If they are, they're in very limited release. I know a couple yeah. of people who definitely want to do more horror comics. Well, now, it's, now, Andrew, it's the space race to the horror comic. Fuck, I better put everything on. <laughs> I'm not even going to wait. I'll just do all of it now. Fuck, I'm just, what, what scares we'll me? We'll do it live. <laughs> no, I'll just uh, I'll draw it myself. That's one thing I'll do for sure. There you go. Uh, but thank you, Adam. Lover. That's, that's the best part, man. That's when you're like really buying an independent book, like Eastman and Laird. They drew it. They wrote it. They distributed it. They Everything, man. They took out a loan to do it. But mm -hmm. they made Ninja Turtles. So, yeah. like that's that's where i'm that's where i'm at it's like look you know when you got one person with both of the vision like you're getting a deeper story i feel just putting that out there mm -hmm. uh everything woke about says so pro any big news with you lately yeah we 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 read the news on air just a moment ago so thank you everything woke about john thomas also says jeff i was a 70s kid so comics were colored by what looked like dot matrix didn't pick up one again until the nineties when the transition to vibrant colors occur. Mm. Oh, when did that the would have been late nineties? Uh, yeah. I think is when that shift to uh, the more vibrant digital print coloring. Yeah. yeah. The digital digital coloring that was used. That, that was a huge game changer. Honestly, that changed. Gosh, that changed everything. That was one of the big things, big selling points with the image guys was, you know, a lot of the coloring techniques that were being used over there were well, they were ahead of Marvel seen. for years. Yeah, that that the coloring that was being used over there at Image, you didn't see that from Marvel and DC for another few years. Yeah, years is right because I'm thinking because like I'm a big Spider Man guy, and a lot of the Mark Bagley stuff is still that simple color. It's just yeah. it had been. I won't say perfected, but it had it's done to the level where you it's like I guess it was that technology had been perfected where it looked great. You could do color yeah. gradients and all this shit before the computer, and they had it down. But McFarland and Co. like image is great for that kind of stuff. Uh Marvel really didn't get into till the late 90s when they introduced their gloss paper across mm -hmm. their books. Like, yeah, 
you you missed out on a lot. But I still stand by the 80s being the best era of comic books because you had the best books. Some of the best had... X-Men books are in the 80s. Marvel was the pretty dominant best. in the 80s, yeah. I would still argue that the 70s was probably peak DC prior to Crises. Because Crises was your like your your swan song. Yeah. Um, I would need to be more well versed in 70s DC before I could give you like such a definitive opinion like I do with my Marvel stuff since I'm more well read. But yeah. what I have read in the 70s for DC, I've enjoyed. I like Batman of that era. I like that version of the character a lot actually he's just cool he's like kind of suave and kind of whatever but batman's also like not the super grim dark tank he's a dude he moves he's got i think he's more visually interesting back then he's not just a black and gray logo essentially so <laughs> from a visual standpoint i think dc's best books come from the 70s hands down a lot of that's neil adams but you know jim Aparo. And I think Intentino was still working in the 70s. I know he... Yeah, yeah. And there's just a lot of great work that was coming out of that place. Uh, you, you can argue every era, every decade has great artists, but maybe the 70s has the biggest overlap of all the greats working at once because you still have Kirby and Ramita, but Neil Adams is there and John Burns there and Frank Miller is on Daredevil at that point, I think. So we're talking coming like... In towards the end, yeah, 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 he is. He's there. They're getting like the best of the best. That, but that's the interesting part too. Is you had all these big names working, and then you had great stuff come out, and now the big names evolve, and you get a lot of nobody. Like here's, I guess it's weird. What I'm trying to get at is nobody creates a big name in comics anymore because they try to use it as a stepping stone to something else. So I hope people understand what we do a lot of us here is like comics are the, that, that main event for a lot of us. That's yeah. not like we're, this we're not, isn't, we're not know, making comics to try and get some uh, Netflix deal that we can sell our IP no. for a quick 15 K or something like that. It's no. like, I joke about stealing, solo being a movie. Life. you know, stealing solo would be a great movie, but it was a great joke that turned into a comic that works. Like that's fine. Wokebusters is a comic. You do stuff in that, that you couldn't do on film not for under a couple hundred million dollars that that that's what there you go folks you want to know the scale of Wolfbusters? if it was made into a movie it would cost 250 million dollars because you need the cgi <laughs> budget to create the monsters but jeff can you do it practically the thing is the size of a skyscraper you can't like oh yeah you, you don't do want to do pretty cheaply oh, oh yeah. really guy in a suit compositing uh super uh yeah super um imposed photography yeah you could you could do it on the indie side of things at a reasonable price it still would be a few million dollars, but you could do it. Um, and if you got the right director and the right cinematographer and you made it look like an, it was shot in the eighties, you'd hide a lot of the, the compositing effects way better than you would with modern day HD lens, uh, HD lenses and HD type of uh, compositing and cinematography. So no, you, I would you, make it look really cool that way. Cause it's just like, Cause that's my whole thing is how do you make this shit feel like you're watching whatever? It's like, Oh yeah, we just used old lenses. We did this, we did that. That'd be cool. It's like yeah. woke busters looks like an eighties flick. Oh yeah. The, the, you can do a lot if you know how to shoot in a way that where you're, you're using the benefit of the degradation of, of film or the transfers from your, your 70 millimeter to your TV broadcast to hide your effects, to make it more look real. And yeah, you, you can find on there's a lot of people. I know a lot of people that know how to do that. They don't get to do that because on the studio side of things, they're like, we don't want that style. This this is the, the method. This is the look that we're we're doing across the majority of movies with a very few exceptions. That's how you got to do it. But I know cinematographers are like, man, just get me just get me like a 35 mil camera. I will give you a movie that looks like it came straight out of 86 <laughs> and, and all the good good parts of of that that style. Um so well I, i'm i'm excited to know what's out there in the future of art to make because that's the stuff i want to make so uh not necessarily stuff that looks like it's old just stuff like it's made from a time where people truly cared like a different i hate how everything looks the same you know like even certain certain books out there it's like you know a lot of dc books they don't have a house style anymore but they have a lot of like similar you know crossover it looks nice. I'm not knocking the artist's work. It's all a nice work. But the editors 
should add a little diversity to the styles because I like when other books look unique. You know, nothing looked like Jack Kirby's artwork. So when he was on Fantastic Four, after other artists took over the other books, it still added a nice visual flair and a difference. So that has been my TED Talk on comic books. I will talk more when we're here to talk more about Wokebusters, which I'm excited. Like I said, folks, I'm done. I have been done for a while, just been doing promotional shit. The stuff to make this campaign be the biggest it can be. And how big is that? Well, you have to find out or watch and find out, folks, because I got a lot of stuff planned and I'm going to execute every one of those plans. So join me for this wild ride to uh, somewhere exciting. But uh, script, Andrew, is there anything you'd like to say before we put this baby to bed? I feel like we're at a two hour mark. It's perfect. Um, I don't really think there's anything else to cover. Plus, I can get a head start on getting some sleep and then watch an X-Men early. Oh, yeah, there oh, you go. Plus, you're idea. already freaking burnt from uh, your con weekend as well. I got con crud, man. I can still party like I did when I was in my early 20s, but, uh, you know, that's about it. Yeah. No, I, I think this was honestly a pretty uh, pretty tight show. Um, my best of, uh, best of luck, best wishes to Pro for you know, in handling all the stuff that he's going to have to handle with, with his website and all of that nonsense. But um, pro, if you end up watching this, or if you uh, are still watching, uh, appreciate you uh, giving your time to us. I know you're a busy guy. Thank you, chat, as always, for being here and being awesome, showing so much love, uh, just in being interactive, not just the super chats, but those as well, obviously. Um, yeah, I think uh, I'm really hopeful, actually, that, at some point in the coming months, we're going to all be able to be really excited about movies that we're talking about on here. I know I'm going to be with uh, Godzilla X Kong this Thursday. I'm so, I'm so freaking hyped. Good. For I'm excited for you. You look happy talking about it, man. And then on top of that, um, what Sony's releasing the Spider-Man films again in theaters, probably to try and make up for the poor performance of Madam Web. Um, and that's fine. Like I'll I'll go see the the five movies in theaters. Shit, I'll I'll do it. Um, and then Star Wars is they're showing the six films in theaters as well, and that's super tempting to go see Episode One in theaters, which is the first one I ever got to see in theaters. I'm I might have to do it. I might have to do it. Do it. Do it. I, I really w I, I wish I could time it with either my folks visiting or me phys visiting my folks because it's sometime in May, right? Is when they're doing it. It's like first week of May or something like that. I'll look into it. Because that'd be super cool to be able to like go see those in theaters with my dad. That would be so awesome. Yeah, get there early in the day because you guys can leave afterwards. Like me personally. I wouldn't be opposed to buying a ticket, figuring exactly what time the original Star Wars starts. Yeah. Watch it. And then, like, if I'm in a good mood, I'll stay for Empire. Stick around for Empire and Jedi, yeah. Because <laughs> all I want to do is just, like, if it's, like, a $40 ticket, which I, I, I want to preface this with, I hate giving Disney money. I like the original Star Wars, though, so much that it's, like, I've had one chance to see it in theaters my entire life, and that was back in 97 uh, for the special edition. So... To see anything on the big screen is usually an exciting thing. And with that sound system, like, I got a nice sound bar. It's cool. It's got a subwoofer. You know, we can make some noise. But movie theater speakers for Star Wars, you know, it's Star Wars. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Maybe maybe it's not worth giving your money to Disney. But I would just... Can somebody, like, get me... Like, can we go rent a theater and play Star Wars? And that's, that's it. <laughs> I right. Yeah, and it's between $750 I, and $1,200, depending on the theater. <laughs> I, I may or may not have the despecialized editions. I, I have it as well. I got the original 4Ks so. um, that just recently released. So. I need to get uh, the 4K 80 and 83. I'm friends with the one of the guys on the restoration team. So mm -hmm. I'm going to find out like how to find links because I own them physically. So I know legally you're allowed to acquire digital copies if you own the physical releases. So I own them on VHS, DVD, uh, Blu-ray. I have Star Wars on 4K. Uh, yeah, I, you know, I'm doing my part, but I've also got my restoration version. 
the only Star Wars VHS I do not have, and only because it wasn't released in my region of Canada, was uh, Revenge of the Sith on VHS. Because mm. it's the only one that doesn't exist on VHS. No, there's uh, there's bootlegs that they've made for it. Oh, okay. Well. But, uh, yeah, I had really the VHS for v- Phantom Menace, and just as with my VHSs for Jurassic Park and Lost World, I killed them. Because I watched what they do so to you. Much. Oh, okay. I, nothing. They gave me wonderful memories. So many that I watched and rewound them far too many times that they eventually died. <laughs> well, <clears throat> folks, we're going to head out of here. Thank you for watching. I'll be back next time with more. I will have all the information on the uh, new Wokebuster stuff, all of that in the coming days. I'm excited. But until then, folks, be smart, be safe, be cool, but always be excellent to each other. Dot com.